We are here on January 5, 2001 to interview Judge Harold Albritton. The interview is being conducted as part of the Oral History Project of the United States District Court for the Middle District of Alabama, a court on which Judge Albritton has served for almost 10 years, the last three of which he has served as Chief Judge. The interview of Judge Albritton is being conducted in his federal courthouse chambers by Dave Boyd, an attorney practicing law in Montgomery, Alabama. Good morning, Judge Albritton. Good morning, Dave. Thank you very much for being with us today and giving us this time to conduct this interview with you as part of our oral history project. Thank you for doing it. Uh, before we uh, get into a little bit about your personal background, I'd just like to, uh, to sort of make it clear uh, what, you, what you do here at the court now and, and what you've done previously in your legal career. Now, you're currently the chief judge of the Middle District of Alabama. Is that right? Mm, that's right. Wh what exactly does the chief judge do in, in the, the federal court system? Well, uh, the chief judge is responsible for administrative duties in the court. Uh, and that runs uh, the gamut of making sure that that uh, the trains run on time, that uh, uh, it involves personnel matters, uh, involves dealing with all of the uh, uh, different aspects of the court, the other judges, the employees of the court. Uh, for me at this time, a great part of the responsibility has been handling the uh, building of the new courthouse. That's been our major project and that's taken a lot of the time of the chief judge now. <coughs> We're going to have an opportunity to uh, talk about that in some detail later today. Uh, do you, as chief judge, continue to carry on the other duties, ordinary duties of a judge, trying cases and the like? Still have the same caseload as, uh, as every other judge. Some districts uh, give the chief judge uh, a lighter caseload than other judges, but that's primarily in the larger courts, and we've never had a tradition of doing that here in this court, so I didn't start the <laughs> I didn't start a new tradition of taking a lighter load. Uh, when did you first uh, go on the federal bench, Judge Albright? 1991, May of 1991. And you became chief judge in 1998, I believe? That's right. And before you went on the federal bench, uh, you were a practicing lawyer? Correct. Uh, what years did, uh, were you involved in the uh, private practice of law? Well, I graduated from law school in uh, 1960 and then practiced law in the Army for two years. Uh, came back to Andalusia and entered private practice with uh, my family law firm there in 1962 and uh, continued until I came here in 1991. Well, I want to ask you some questions about that in a few minutes, but before we do that, let's back up and, and talk about your uh, early years and your childhood. Where were you born, Judge? Born in Andalusia, Alabama. And that's down in Covington County, right? That's right. Down in the uh, southernmost south central part of the state of Alabama. Well, that's right, right on the uh, Florida line. What year were you born? In 1936, December the 19th. Uh, who, uh, who were your parents? Well, my father was Robert Bynum Albritton, and uh, my mother was Carrie Veal Albritton. And your father, uh, like yourself, later on was a practicing lawyer there in Andalusia. Is that right? He was. I practiced with him. And who were your uh, grandparents? Well, my father's parents were William Harold Albritton, after whom I was named, uh, and uh, Annie Rebecca Mashburn Albritton. My mother's uh, parents were uh, Louis Veal and Mary Veal from Louisville, Alabama, originally, and uh, uh, my that grandfather died at a very early age, and uh, my grandmother moved my mother and all the rest of her family to Tuscaloosa, where she grew up. So you have some Barber County roots and some Tuscaloosa roots and some Covington County roots. That's correct. Among other places. That's right. Tell me a little bit about your uh, education as a child at the primary and secondary levels. Well, I went to uh, the public schools in, in uh, Andalusia, East Three Nights Grammar School, uh, same grammar school my uh, 
father went to in the same building, and the same building that my uh, all three of my sons went to, and that uh, some grandchildren have been going to. They're moving out of that building this month, I think. Uh, in the 11th grade, I went to I moved up to Marion Military Institute and went there the last two years of high school. Graduated from there. Uh, you weren't the first uh, generation of your family to have attended Marion Military Institute, I understand. No, my grandfather went to, to Marion uh, before going to the University of Alabama. And I believe you were the uh, valedictorian of that graduating class at, at Marion, if I'm not mistaken. Well, that's correct in 19, 90, 1955. <laughs> What was it like growing up in Andalusia? And why don't you tell us a little bit about, about Andalusia, how big it is, and sort of what was going on there when you were a child? Well, it was great growing up there. It's a, a town of uh, about 10,000 people. Uh, uh, wonderful place to grow up. Wonderful place to raise a family. Near your old hometown of Greenville, that part of the, of the state of Alabama is a, is a fine place to live. It's close to the coast. Uh, uh, it's close to, to other cities if you want to go to them, but you have the, the uh, uh, fine parts of living in a small town. You get to know everybody, uh, enjoy the people. I have uh, a lot of fond memories of growing up in, in Andalusia. I understand that uh, you did not have any siblings. Only child. Only child. My uh, father was one of 11 children and my mother was one of nine children. I was an only child. Well, the Albritton family uh, has been in uh, Covington County in Andalusia for a long time. Well, that's right, since uh, 1887. And we're going to talk about the, the founding of the family law firm here in a few minutes, but I guess that was the occasion for the, uh, for the family to, to move there at about the same time that I guess your great-great-grandfather uh, founded the law firm that you later were the... Uh, senior partner in? Great-grandfather. Great-great-grandfather. Yeah, he came down in 1887 from North Carolina. Well, after you graduated from uh, Marion Military Inst Institute, you uh, went on to college at the University of Alabama, is that right? That's right. How did you come to select uh, Alabama uh, over perhaps some other other colleges? Well, I've been a, a a fan of the University of Alabama since childhood. That's really about the only place I thought about going. I, I'd been a football fan of there, a, a fan of the school. My mother and father had both uh, been to the University of Alabama. Uh, my grandfather had been to the University of Alabama. Uh, there was a, an Alabama tradition in the family that uh, I'd been going there, visiting with relatives who lived in Tuscaloosa since childhood spending uh, weekends for homecoming and everything else there, and it was just a natural thing to, for me to move on to the university. And that loyalty has remained to this day, I'm quite sure. I understand that you were, among other things, vice president of the Student Government Association while you were there. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think you were named the outstanding freshman student. Uh, you're a member of Phi Beta Kappa, academic honorary, uh, Omicron Delta Kappa, uh, honorary and Jason's, which is a University of Alabama uh, honorary uh, for, uh, for for senior men. Uh, you you uh, stayed uh, on in Tuscaloosa. Uh, I take it to uh, to attend law school. Was there any break between your college and your and your law school? No. In in fact. Uh Rather than having a break, I kind of accelerated things. Uh, back at, at that time, you could uh, you could go to law school at the University of Alabama after three years of undergraduate school at, at the university. And then after your first year of law school, you got your undergraduate degree and finished up uh, <clears throat> the last two years in law school. <coughs> so, and I went to summer school a couple of summers, so I ended up uh, finishing the whole thing a little over five years. I, I graduated in August of 1960 from law school and started undergraduate school in September of 1955. You were on an accelerated program. Yeah. And while at the uh, law school, uh, you were a member of the Law Review and a member of the uh, Fair Order jurisprudence, which later, of course, became a chapter of the Order of the Coy. Yeah. 
Uh, do you have any particular recollections or, of your law school experience that stand out in your mind? Interesting personalities or professors or any, anyone that you encountered? Well, Lee Harrison was, uh, was the dean then, and he was a, a, a great person with, I have fond memories of, of him. We had such professors as, uh, as John Payne and, and Torts that uh, many people remember from up there as a, a very tough professor in that and in other subjects, uh, Clint McGee and <coughs> criminal law and criminal procedure. and. Uh, uh, was one of the most colorful, I guess the most colorful maybe, uh, of the professors at that time was Sam Beatty. Uh, I always remember my uh, early years uh, there, the first year there, when he was teaching a course and, and, and demonstrating that it was uh, in civil remedies, uh, legal remedies, and he was demonstrating the difference between assault and battery, and he suddenly picked up a book, threw it at one of the members of the class and said, now if it had hit you, that would have been assault and battery. Since it missed you, it was merely an assault. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever give any thought to not going to law school? Um, well, a little bit. I, from Really, from early on, I, I wanted to be a lawyer. That's, that's always what I had in mind. The only thing that that I did give some serious thought to the possibility of doing other than that was uh, was journalism. I got very interested in that in high school. I worked as a as a cub reporter for the Andalusia Star News, weekly paper there, uh, uh, during the week and some in the summertime. And uh, the editor of the Andalusia Star News, very colorful uh, person there, Ed Danley, uh, had me doing such interesting things as writing the obituaries and. Uh, uh, things of that nature. I remember the first big story he gave me was to cover uh, 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 the annual meeting of the Alabama Electric Cooperative, and I, th I thought that was really a, a big deal. I got, in, in fact, got a byline on it. So uh, I did give that some serious thought. Uh, worked on the newspaper while I was at Marion, uh, but uh, that was just just thinking. I really stayed with with my idea of going into law. And of course, you come from a family of lawyers. Yeah, I was uh, the fourth generation in, in my family, and my three sons are carrying on the tradition of, the, of being the fifth generation in our family to be lawyers. Uh, we, we just never could figure out anything else to do. <laughs> well, after your graduation from uh, law school, you uh, did some military service, as I understand from reading your uh, biography. That's right. I had uh, a commission, an infantry commission through uh, ROTC, and you know back at that time uh, we had the draft, there was no war going on at that time, it was between the Korean uh, War and, the, and Vietnam, but we still had the draft so everybody, all, all young men were either going in voluntarily or being drafted, practically everybody. Um, I'd gone to Marion Military Institute and and uh, and then in ROTC at, at Alabama and had an infantry commission. Uh, I got deferred through law school and then transferred branches to to uh, Judge Advocate General Corps and went in in, in uh, the fall of 1960. And you uh, remained in the military until 1962? That's right. I went to JAG school at at, uh, uh, at University of Virginia. We had a new baby. My oldest son had, had been born, and we uh, put him in the car and uh, and trucked up to Charlottesville, Virginia, for three months. Uh, we had in mind some exciting place to go in the army. Uh, I figured if I worked real hard and and studied hard and made good grades that I'd have an opportunity to uh, do something that I wanted to do, so they asked us to give, a, give our preferences as to where we wanted to go, and I listed Europe first and uh, Hawaii second and the Presidio and San Francisco third. I worked real hard and did fine uh, with grades, and they sent me to 
Fort Hood, Texas. <laughs> and that's the Army for you. <laughs> the fortunate thing about it is uh, that's out in the middle of the desert in, in uh, Texas. Uh, it's an armored post, and uh, I was trying course martial, and there were a lot of them because the troops didn't have anything to do except get drunk, fight each other, steal things, run away, and, and so there were, <laughs> there were a lot of cases, and I stayed in court an awful lot. And that was a very interesting, that was about a year and a half. Uh, we'd sw swap around and uh, be on the prosecution side for several months and then on the defense side for several months, and uh, it kept me very busy. And I'm sure it was uh, excellent training for your future career as a trial lawyer. It was, absolutely. We, uh, and not just in being a trial lawyer, but in, in uh, some other things about being a lawyer, I, I, I remember that. There was another person that had gone through JAG school with me, uh, Harold Waters, and we went out there together and we were the trial team. One of us would be the prosecutor, one of us would be the defense counsel. And we lived near each other, next to each other. And uh, Jane and I just had one car and, and uh, uh, he had one car, so we'd take turns riding into work together and then the wives would keep the other car. And we were going through a pretty strong trial at one time, and about midway through, my client told me in the afternoon, said, uh, Lieutenant Albright, and I noticed that you and Lieutenant Waters uh, just get out of the same car and come in and then get in the same car and go home at night. Do y'all just, uh, when it's all over, just say, well, good luck next time and laugh at each other and go on off together. He said, that makes me feel kind of uncomfortable. <laughs> and so I gave him a, a, a talk about how lawyers can, can uh, uh, be friends but still fight and all. Well, that, that doesn't mean a whole lot to clients. And I, I, I learned then that you have to be careful about appearances as well as uh, actualities. You were uh, discharged uh, as captain, I believe, and That's then right and then entered into the private law practice uh, immediately thereafter. Came right back to Andalusia and started practicing law. Did you give any consideration to, to going anywhere else other than back to Andalusia to practice law? Uh, serious consideration. I, I was, uh, had a, a, a very flattering and interesting offer from a, a big firm in Birmingham and we talked a lot about it. And I was. Uh, I appreciated the offer and the opportunity. We ended up deciding, Jane and I together, to uh, what we wanted to do was go back to Andalusia. Jane's not back from Andalusia, she's not from there, but she agreed with me that that was, uh, that was the course we wanted to take. Let me move on now to ask you some questions, Judge, about your family. Uh, and let's start uh, by sort of circling back a bit because uh, in our previous discussion, you've mentioned your wife, Jane, several times. And uh, tell me about how you met your wife and when and, and what the circumstances were. Well, Jane's from Tuscumbia and, and uh, at the other end of the state from Andalusia up on the Tennessee line where I'm down at the Florida line, uh, we met. Uh, during fraternity and sorority rush at the University of Alabama our freshman year, uh, we met on a blind date and uh, it was for a rush party that I was going to and she had just uh, pledged Kappa Kappa Gamma. The uh, fraternity rush was still going on and fraternities were lining up dates and the sororities were uh, doing the same so we met on a, on a blind date for uh, a fraternity rush party and uh, dated each other for the rest of, uh, of our time uh, at the university and got married when I was a freshman in law school. And that was in 1958? Married in 1958, June of 1958. And so your wife Jane was, uh, was with you through law school and through your military experience, as you've previously mentioned. She was not only with me during law school, she helped put me through law school. She graduated from the university and taught uh, uh, in a public school out in the county in Tuscaloosa to uh, help finish putting me through law school. <laughs> and 
I'd like to ask you about your children. Uh, I think you uh, have three sons, is that right? I do. And the oldest, uh, Hal, his name's William Harrell Albritton IV, uh, was born when, as I mentioned a little earlier, while I was in law school. And uh, uh, he's married. Hal's married to Lucy Smith from Mobile. And uh, they had our first grandchild, who's uh, our granddaughter Rollins, who's last month turned 16. So that was our, that's our first. Our second son, uh, Ben, Benjamin Howard Albritton, was born uh, while I was in the Army. He was born at Fort Hood, Texas. And uh, I'll always remember that he, uh, he was born in the Army Hospital out there, and the, the total cost to us was uh, $8. <laughs> so we paid we pay, pay $8 for, for the birth of our second son. <laughs> Ben's married, uh, is married to Sharon Maloof from Birmingham, uh, has three children. His oldest son is named after him, Benjamin Howard Jr. We call him Buddy. Uh, Buddy will be 11 next month. Uh, then their daughter, their middle child, is uh, Bynum. Bynum's seven years old and a, a real honey. And then their third uh, uh, is William, Will, uh, and Will's five. They live in Mobile, uh, where Ben practices law. Then uh, our youngest, Tom, was born in 1967 in Andalusia, and uh, uh, he lives in Andalusia now, and he's married to Amanda Riggs from Camden, and they have two children. Uh, their oldest is uh, the daughter, Hunter, who's, who's seven years old, and then they have a son, James, who's four, and that rounds out our, our family. Three sons, three daughters-in-law, and six grandchildren. And all three sons are, are lawyers here in the state of Alabama. Yes, they are. I'm very proud of all three of them. They, they all three graduated from the University of Alabama Law School. Um, Hal and Tom are practicing with my old law firm in Andalusia. Uh, ben practices uh, uh, in Mobile as a partner in the Janicky Newell firm in, in uh, Mobile. All three of them are primarily involved in trial work. Judge Albritton, we've mentioned several times uh, your family law firm or the law firm in Andalusia. Uh, that's, uh, that's a story in itself, I think, that I'd like to talk to you about. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the, the law firm in Andalusia that you joined in 1962 and remained with until you went on the federal bench and, and where your two sons uh, practice now. Well firm started uh, back in 1887. My great-grandfather, uh, Edgar T. Albritton, Ed T. Albritton, was a young lawyer in his 20s up in uh, North Carolina. Uh, he, he lived in Snow Hill, North Carolina, and his wife, he had two children, a son and a daughter, when his, his young wife died. And he was devastated. He wanted to, uh, to leave and get away. He took his two children to uh, uh, live with a maiden aunt of theirs in, in Washington, D.C. And he got on a train and, and uh, just said he was going to head south and just go to the end of, end of nowhere. He ended up, uh, the story goes that he ended up with a train stopping uh, uh, in Greenville your old hometown, Dave, and uh, he got off and there was a circus going on near the train station, so he, he got off and walked around and during the circus and, and he happened to bump into a, another young lawyer there by the name of Dempsey Powell, and they got to talking about what my great-grandfather wanted to do, and he said, well, I, I want to set up a law practice and I just want to go to, want to get as far away as I can. and, and referred to it as the end of nowhere. I just want to go to the end of nowhere. So 
uh, Dempsey Powell said, well, Andalusia is the perfect spot for you. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have many uh, people there practicing law now. It's not on the train line right now, so uh, I'd recommend that you go there about 50 miles away. Uh, he, he got a horse and buggy and put his few belongings in it and headed to Andalusia where he hung out a shingle. Ed T. Albritton, lawyer. Had he been trained as a lawyer? Yes, and, uh, uh, and he, he started practicing by himself. A few years later, uh, he and Dempsey Powell from Greenville formed a partnership. Uh, uh, Powell and Albritton, Dempsey Powell was a few years older than my great-grandfather. He ended up serving in the state senate and, and other things, uh, Mr. Powell did. He also, uh, through the years, had a, a practice in Greenville. He had a, a practice in Greenville and in Andalusia. His Greenville practice was Powell and Hamilton. Uh, still, that firm's still going on down there in Greenville. Um, and in, in uh, Andalusia, in the firm there, he ended up practicing with my great-grandfather, with, uh, with my grandfather, and with my father and two of my uncles. So he practiced with three generations of my family before his death. Uh, that's the way it got started. My, my great-grandfather ended up uh, serving as, uh, he, he was the first elected mayor of the city of Andalusia. Uh, they had had, I think, a couple of appointed mayors at that time, pretty new city city, it was a pretty new town at the time, and uh, uh, the first time they had an election for mayor, he was elected mayor. He later served as a county judge uh, there in Covington County. Then, uh, not too long after he had moved to Andalusia, he sent for, well, for his son at that time. His, his daughter had, had died at a very early age there in Washington, and he sent for his son, my grandfather, and uh, they put him uh, on a train, and he came down and, and uh, moved down to Andalusia. My uh, great-grandfather remarried. So my grandfather grew up there in Andalusia, went to Marion Institute, uh, as I said a while ago, and then the University of Alabama, uh, and law school there, came back. What was your grandfather's name? That was William Harold Albritton. And that's... Uh person for whom your your name well him and and uh, I'm named for him and for one of my uncles who was a junior I see <laughs> uh, the firm then became Powell Albritton and Albritton my great-grandfather my grandfather practicing with Dempsey Powell went on for a while it's uh, uh, then my my father and two of my uncles came back in the firm my uncle Bill Albritton, William Harrell Jr., came back uh, actually a little couple of years, two or three years before my father did, although he was younger than my father. He, uncle Bill went to the University of Alabama, University of Alabama Law School. After about a year in law school, he, he, he decided he didn't want to put up with the uh, a regiment of law school and didn't f feel like he needed it that much anyway, so he came back to Andalusia and was named Register in Chancery and worked in the law firm, uh, as they called back then, reading the law, and then took the bar exam, uh, as you could do then, without ac actually graduating from law school, and uh, was admitted to practice in Alabama. Turned out to be one of the, I think, one of the most brilliant lawyers in the state. He was one of the early tax specialist in, in, uh, in Alabama. Uh, my father, after graduating from undergraduate school at Alabama, went down to Florida to uh, take part in the, uh, in the great land boom in Florida, and it turned into the great land bust in Florida, and after, <laughs> after the, the bust in the 1920s, he came back to law school. When he finished law school, he and my mother were married while they were in law school. Uh, he came back down to the firm in Andalusia. And then uh, an uncle of mine, Marvin Albritton, uh, went to law school at Alabama after being in the Navy in World War II, and, uh, and then came back to the 
to the law firm. So they were practicing there, and and uh, Dempsey Powell died while uh, uh, during that early time when my uncles were practicing. Uh, Albert Rankin entered the firm, and the firm became uh, All Britons. They pluralized it because there were so many of them there by then, All Britons and Rankin. And uh, Albert was a, a wonderful person, died a number of years ago, but uh, I practiced with him as well. Then when I got out of the Army in 1962, I came back with him. And who all was, was there in the firm when you came back in 1962? Uh, it was my, my father. Uh, my uncle Bill, my uncle Marvin, and Albert Rankin, and uh, and then I came in. Uh, then Hal came back to practice with us uh, when he graduated from Al uh, Alabama Law School. Hal uh, had other opportunities to go other places and and uh, thought seriously about accepting uh, offers and and. Birmingham, and like I did, decided to come back home to Andalusia, and I was very proud that he did make that decision. Uh, uh, ben decided that he was going to go his own way. Ben got uh, an undergraduate degree from Auburn in uh, building sciences, got out of undergraduate school and got in the construction business for about three years and decided to go back to law school. So he was in law school in Alabama with his little brother. Time they went through law school the same uh, year, but Ben uh, decided uh, uh, that he would not practice in Andalusia, and he's uh, now in Mobile and enjoying it very much. Uh, and then Tom got out of law school at Alabama, and, and uh, uh, as well considered accepting offers in, in again in Birmingham, but elected to come back with his brother. I was already up here on the bench by the time he got out, and uh, but he went back with his brother and others to, to practice, and that's where they are now. Well, I, your law firm uh, holds what I think is a, is a very important distinction here in the state of Alabama. Why don't you tell us about, uh, about that? Well, it is the, it is the oldest uh, continuous law firm in the state. Uh, it began in 1887, and it, 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 there's not been a break. There are some firms, I think, that trace back to uh, uh, earlier roots, but with breaks uh, of some time in between and then picking up again. This, this firm is, is, uh, is the oldest continuing law firm in the state. And with two of my sons down there, that's the fifth generation of the, of the family in the law firm. The firm's name now is uh, All Britons, Clifton, Alverson, and Moody. It's been there continuously since 1887. Yes, it has. And although we talk a lot about my family in it, uh, the law firm wouldn't be the firm it is without some non-family members in it, too. We've al always had some uh, very outstanding non-family members. We, we uh, uh, Albert Rankin was one that I mentioned a while ago. John Gavan practiced for a number of years with our firm in Andalusia, retired. Oh, three or four years ago, I think. Uh, Rick Clifton is is uh, there in the firm, carrying on the the uh, tax and corporate end of the of the firm. Bill Alverson is a member of the firm. Julie Moody is uh, another member of the firm. First uh, woman lawyer in the firm, and uh, she's from Covington County. And then Ben Bowden is uh, the youngest member of the firm there. Over all the years of the existence of the firm, has it been a, a general law practice? Yes, it's um, it's been a, a, a general law practice uh, that, that's uh, practiced in a in a uh, a wide area around the state. Uh, at one time, with my great grandfather and grandfather, they had a fairly sizable practice that extended into Florida. And, and also some, uh, uh, when I got back into practice, um, there's always been quite a bit of, of, uh, of work in, in estate planning, uh, taxation, uh, corporate work. Uh, there's, there's been, there was 
uh, a large part of the practice has been in litigation. It uh, was when I was practicing there, and, and it still is, uh, with uh, trying cases all around the state. Primarily has been uh, work in the defense of civil litigation, but other types too. That's, that's been the emphasis. Uh, tell me a little about your personal law practice there in Andalusia from the time you came back to the firm in 1962 until you went on the federal bench in 1991. I know you were a, an accomplished litigator. Did you, did you ever do any other kind of work there at the firm? Well, when I first came into the firm, it was understood that uh, uh, I was going to lend some assistance to my Uncle Bill, who I mentioned a while ago was a uh, tax specialist, and I was going to work in the field of taxation and corporate law. At that time, uh, the major industry in Andalusia was Alatex, which manufactured shirts and it was a huge manufacturer with plants in, I think, six cities. And, uh, and our firm was general counsel for them. Uh, my father was on the board of directors, and it was that was a, a big client, and I was going to be doing a good bit of work with that, and and uh, also in the uh, general field of taxation, estate planning, corporate work, that sort of thing. Uh, and I did that for a while. Two things happened. One was uh, that I, I really uh, I enjoyed it, but it was it was not really my thing. I started doing a little bit of litigation and, and, and that was and it, I really got very interested in doing that and it was it became obvious that you couldn't do both and be competent at it. Another thing was uh, Altex was sold. It was a local company and, and uh, so this large client was sold to a, uh, uh, an out-of-state firm and ended up uh, not being a client anymore, so the nature of our practice changed. Scares us all to death. <laughs> that happens with lawyers, as you know, and you never know what your practice may be like uh, because of something like that. Turned out to be a, a blessing in disguise, I think, because it had taken up a, a lot of time of lawyers and, and made them unavailable to do other things. This opened the door to, uh, to other things, including more litigation practice that I got involved in. From then on, I I did some other things, uh, some corporate work, but uh, and some estate work, but primarily a trial lawyer. And I take it you had the opportunity to, to try cases uh, not only there in Covington County, but in other parts of South Alabama and perhaps perhaps elsewhere. Yeah, I did. I I, uh, uh, I enjoyed practicing all over the state. Uh, a lot of it around in in uh, the various counties in South Alabama, uh, and but in all the federal courts, and and uh, some practice in Birmingham, and up to Huntsville, and, and around in different places. I uh, was primarily involved in defense of civil litigation. Uh, when I started out, I was uh, doing the the little slip and fall cases, the, the uh, whiplash cases, <laughs> fender benders and things of that nature. Uh, later in, in my practice it turned into more uh, uh, products liability work and uh, some medical malpractice work and, and uh, insurance defense, various things of that nature. I, although, although it was mostly defense of civil litigation. I did do some plaintiff's work and some occasionally some criminal practice, uh, which added to the, the interest of, of the practice. And you're far too modest to bring this up on your own, but I, 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 I want to. Uh, your, your outstanding career as a, as a litigator, as a trial lawyer, was recognized by your election uh, to be a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers. Uh, what year was that, do you recall? <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, I, I don't. I, I was very honored uh, over that, uh, being elected by other members of the college in Alabama. Uh, the two of us from Alabama were elected to the 
College of Trial Lawyers that year, uh, uh, Bernie Harwood from Tuscaloosa, who uh, will be sworn in later this month as a new member of the Supreme Court of Alabama, was the other member, and we went up to the big city, went up to New York City to be sworn in, and uh, that was quite an occasion. Were there some particularly interesting or exciting or memorable cases that you were involved in while you were uh, uh, trying cases for that period of, gosh, almost 30 years? I'll never forget the first uh, civil case I tried before a jury when I got back to Andalusia because I lost it. <laughs> and uh, it was a little slip and fall case. Uh, I was representing one of the stores there where a person had fallen and we tried the case. and, and uh, the jury came back with a verdict of $1,500 for the plaintiff, and I came back all crestfallen, and everybody in the firm was saying, oh, you, that's, a, uh, that's a, a victory, that they were trying to get a lot more money than that. And I said, well, at any time that I don't win, it's not a victory to me. It didn't feel like a victory, but everybody consoled me, and I, I still didn't think it was, but I, I remember that case very well. Uh, through the years, I, I did uh, you know, one of the things that was it was interesting. I represented one of the drug manufacturing companies in, in defending uh, lawsuits uh, all over the state, and uh, that that was quite interesting experience. I occasionally was involved in in criminal cases. Uh, probably one of the most memorable, if not the most memorable, was a, was the first time I was appointed to handle a. <clears throat> a death penalty case, and uh, that was quite an experience. Uh, this was in the 1970s. Uh, they appointed two lawyers to represent the defendant. The uh, court appointed Sid Fuller and, and me to uh, represent the defendant. Uh, Sid, very outstanding lawyer in, in Andalusia, uh, a few years older than I am. Uh, this was a young black man who was uh, charged with murder uh, in the robbery and shooting of a, a very popular uh, white filling station owner in, in uh, Covington County. And uh, there were a lot of high feelings about the case. It had gotten a lot of publicity. And we were appointed to represent the, the defendant uh, he continued to insist to us that he uh, was innocent. Uh, we went, we spent an awful lot of time putting that together. It, it made me realize how serious this sort of thing was. I'd never had any experience with it before. In fact, the first thing I did uh, when I got that appointment, never having uh, handled one of those cases, was to pick up the phone and, and call my old University of Alabama classmate Morris Dees, who uh, had established along with Millard Fuller, another classmate, the Southern Poverty Law Center, and at that time they were doing an awful lot of uh, uh, capital case representation. That was their big thing at the time. So I called him and I told him I had just been appointed to a capital case and I needed somebody to give me some help and tell me what kind of motions I needed to make and, and some of the formalities of it. I knew how to try a lawsuit, but I, I, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't leaving any bases uncovered. So he said, well, let me, I'm gonna put you on the phone with, uh, with our specialist. He's, he's probably uh, more knowledgeable about death penalty law than anybody in the country. His name's John Carroll. So he put me on with John, and of course, as you know, John's now the chief magistrate judge here at, in, uh, in our court. Uh, he was the head of their uh, trial group at the time, so John and I talked about it. He sent me a book that they had put together of, uh, of motions that needed to be filed and, uh, and uh, all kinds of procedural things like that. So uh, Sid and I got that and we filed all the necessary motions and made sure all of his rights were protected there. And, uh, we went through the trial, that they were all overruled incidentally, <laughs> but uh, we had, had protected the record. Uh, we spent an inordinate amount of time preparing that case. It involved ballistics experts and uh, of, of two kinds, and, and it was very involved. 
We went through the trial that lasted several days, and uh, the jury found him not guilty. Uh, they, uh, some of them told us after, sometime after it was over that they were satisfied that there was uh, reasonable doubt and that they were, were persuaded on the basis of reasonable doubt. Uh, the case ended. We felt drained. We stood up. Our client got up from the table, didn't say a word to us, walked out the back, got with his mother, who was sitting in the courtroom. She didn't say a word to us, and they left. Uh, that left us a little bit crestfallen. We picked up our briefcases, walked out, got to the front steps of the courthouse in Andalusia, and a number of people were out in front of the courthouse, and it was the family of the deceased who proceeded to give us a hard time about our representation of the defendant. Uh, we explained to him that we'd been appointed by the court and it was our duty to do this. And uh, they, in effect, said, well, you didn't have to try. <laughs> and we said, well, we were sure they didn't understand, but, but uh, we were lawyers. and. Uh, and we did the best we could. And we got through them, and uh, it was a terrible experience. Sid and I had been planning on going out and having dinner together or something after it was over, but by the time we got through with that, we both looked at each other and <laughs> said, I'm going home. So we did. Uh, Sounds like that experience would be as close as a lawyer could come to the real Atticus Finch experience. <laughs> well, it. Uh, it, it, it was real up close and personal with me at that time about the, the feelings that you have, with, number one, of uh, the responsibility that you have when you're representing somebody who's facing the death penalty. That's about as serious as it can get. And second, the experience of, of representing an unpopular client, your responsibilities in it, your very mixed feelings about all of it. Uh, and all you can tell yourself, and, and I did at the time, that uh, we were doing what a lawyer was supposed to do, and, and we, felt, uh, we felt good about it. Uh, the, the rest of the story that made it better, I think, was about five years later, a little bit later, I got a call uh, from my secretary and said, Mr. So-and-so is out here to see you. And the name rang a bell, and I realized it was the son of the victim in the case. And I thought, oh, Lord, what's, what's going on now? So I said, fine, bring him in. So he came in, and he sat down, and he said, I want to ask you first if, call the name of the defendant, kill my daddy. And I said, well, I don't know. I don't know. He always told us he didn't. Whether he did or not, uh, it's not uh, it, it's not my decision. He said he didn't. We represented him the best we could. The jury found him not guilty. He said, "Well, I just wanted to know if you if you knew." He said that satisfies me. Now I want to tell you, I've been sued in a case that that may cost me my business. I don't have any insurance for it. And I want you to represent me and, and, and do it just like you did him. <laughs> and I said, well, I, are you sure? And he said, yes, I'm sure. <laughs> and I said, all right, I'll be happy to. And I did, and we won his case. <laughs> so it all came to a, 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 a good ending, I guess. Any, I, any other cases that stand out in your mind? Well, talking about being primarily a, a civil defense lawyer, I did. Uh, a few years before I came on the bench, I had represented a, a few plaintiffs in cases too, but uh, not too long before coming on, I, I represented a, a plaintiff in a, a fraud case against an insurance company and, and uh, had the rush of getting a million and a half dollar verdict from a jury. <laughs> so that was an interesting experience. You know, uh, uh, being on an active practice of, of uh, trying cases, you, you can see things from both sides. But that was a fun experience on the other side of the table. Yeah. Throughout the, the handling of, of, uh, of litigation, 
of all types, it, it, and you know this, it really develops and developed in me a, a, a respect for lawyers who get in the pit and try lawsuits. Uh, trial lawyers, and when I say trial lawyers, I mean lawyers who try lawsuits on both sides of the table, uh, get a lot of bad press. Uh, that's just something that's going to happen in an adversary system like we have. Uh, I, I, I love lawyers and I respect them and I, I, I enjoyed knowing and practicing with lawyers on both sides of the table. You, when you do a lot of that kind of work, you, you respect people on the other side, you know what they feel like, you're sitting there waiting on a jury to come back that's going to have a great effect on whoever wins and whoever loses. You know what that other lawyer's feeling, sitting there waiting on a jury, and uh, they know uh, what you feel like. And uh, uh, I enjoyed it. I loved it. Well, Judge, you got to know lawyers on both sides of cases, not only by, by trying cases, but also by being heavily involved in uh, state bar activities. Is that right? Yeah, I worked uh, with the state bar for uh, a long time from uh, the time I first started practicing law. I was involved with, uh, at that time, it was called the Young Lawyers Section. Uh, uh, well, at that time, it was called the Junior Bar. Now it's called Young Lawyers. Uh, and then on up in various committees and uh, finally ended up serving as president of the state bar, which was a great honor. You served as president of the state bar in uh, 1990, 1991, if I recall. Right. Um, you were not the first member of your family, though, to have served as state bar president. No, my father served as president of the state bar back in uh, 71 and 72. I was in practice with him at the time and, uh, and uh, uh, enjoyed his term on, uh, as president, and I, I enjoyed following him up. It's a tradition uh, with Alabama State Bar Presidents that the, their picture, along with their family, uh, appears on the cover of the Alabama Lawyer, which is the official publication of the uh, Alabama State Bar. And I ask you if you could locate the, uh, the copy of the Alabama Lawyer that had your picture and your family's uh, picture when you were a State Bar President. Yeah, I, I, I pulled it. That's us. <laughs> and that's the, uh, night, I guess, 19 uh, summer. Or September of 1990. September of 1990. Well, that's a wonderful family. I agree with that. I found it really interesting, Judge, in talking with you earlier to uh, that you had sort of a unique situation where you were state bar president at the time that you uh, were nominated and confirmed to the uh, federal bench. Tell us a little about how you worked through that seeming conflict, I suppose some could say. It was a, a matter of concern as to just what to do about it. I was sworn in uh, as judge in May of 1991 and my term as president of the state bar was to expire in July. So before being sworn in, I had to find out what happened. Did I need to, uh, did I need to resign or, or what? I, my preference was to continue with it because we had some programs going that I wanted to finish up and, uh, and uh, it was just gonna be a couple of months. And so I was hoping that I would not have to resign. Uh, I, I checked with the uh, state bar ethics people and also with the federal courts uh, committee on canons of ethics and uh, and both said there was no prohibition against it that the only th problem from the judicial end of it was that it it couldn't be something that detracted from your uh, duties as as judge but that uh, although there'd never been anybody in in Alabama that had done that there had been maybe one or two of people around the country who had had served as, particularly with the American Bar Associated, Association, had served as one kind of officer or another while being on the federal bench. So having been cleared by both, 
the state and the uh, and the judicial uh, group, I decided to continue. So I I did serve my last two months uh, as state bar president while I was a judge, and I I gave the farewell address in Mobile at the bar convention and, and bad farewell to the <laughs> to my fellow lawyers. I told them that I I, I wanted to assure them that. Uh, uh, as I had assured uh, Senator Heflin during my uh, questioning before the Judiciary Committee that I, I would consider myself to be appointed and not anointed, and uh, that uh, I considered this to be a lateral transfer. <laughs> well, if one of the one of the lawyers here in the Middle District who's had the good fortune to practice before you. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to note that you've kept true to that promise. <laughs> well, you're kind to say that. Were there any uh, particular issues uh, uh, in affecting the state bar while you were president that you had to, to work through, or any particular programs that you uh, found to be uh, of, of great importance and emphasis? Well, in, in addition to the to the regular uh, things that the state bar does year in and year out which are, are many. Uh, one of the things that, that I started that year that I was pleased with, and it's, uh, it, it's still going on, I think now in a committee form rather than a task force, but uh, I've founded the, a task force on, uh, on uh, minority participation uh, and uh, opportunity. And we set up a, a biracial task force to uh, try to uh, have more minority lawyers be active in state bar work and also to work with law firms and, and other employers on opening opportunities. Uh, we got the, the, uh, that, that task force formed. I appointed my son Hal as one of the first members on that committee. Judge Charlie Price agreed to serve as, as chairman of it and it's, it's been going on ever since. One of the one of the issues at the time uh, that I was in was the question of uh, whether lawyers should be required to do free legal work for the poor. Mandatory pro bono is the term being used. It was going around in some places, particularly in in the state of New York, uh, with uh, at that time, as I recall, the the Supreme well, the Court of Appeals, I guess, of New York was was thinking about having a rule that required all lawyers as a condition to practice to uh, use a certain number of hours with uh, pro bono work, that, that you couldn't practice law without doing that. And that was becoming a, a topic of conversation around the state. I was, uh, I was not in favor of mandatory pro bono, but we had had a, a committee working for uh, for a while up to then on putting together a, a voluntary pro bono program in Alabama. I'd been involved in that some before, and uh, that was one of the things that we finished and that I wanted to spend a little more time making sure it was, it was, was finished during my term was putting together the Alabama State Bar Volunteer Lawyers Program, uh, which provided a network of volunteer lawyers around the state who would volunteer to give a certain amount of time uh, to representing people who couldn't afford uh, lawyers in civil matters. And we hired a, a director and got that off the ground and it's going very strong now. It's a program that I, I was very proud of, a very necessary program. That issue of mandatory pro bono uh, came up later in a question to you and your confirmation hearings, is that right? It did. Uh, when I was before the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, Senator Cole uh, asked me, he, he said that he had noticed that in a column that I'd written in the, in the Alabama Lawyer magazine of the State Bar, uh, that I'd written that I was opposed to mandatory pro bono. And he wanted to know why, why I was opposed to it. And uh, I told him that 
I was opposed to requiring lawyers to give free work to the poor, just as I was opposed to doctors being required to, to uh, give free medical attention to uh, to the poor, or grocers being required to give free groceries, or filling station owners to give free gas, or, or other things like that. But that I was glad he asked the question because the, the context of the article that I'd written in the Alabama Lawyer uh, was that those of us who were opposed to mandatory pro bono, lawyers being required to do this, uh, had a particular responsibility to make sure that this was done on a voluntary basis because I felt and feel now that lawyers have an ethical and moral duty to assist people who, who cannot afford legal services and that it's one of, the, uh, one of the highest things that a lawyer can do is to provide uh, legal services to the poor, not to be required to do it, but to do it because they want to and because they feel they should. So the article was was introducing the Alabama State Bar Volunteer Lawyer Program, which we had just uh, kicked off and had gotten a director hired. And, and it was urging all the lawyers in the state to participate in it because of the responsibility that they, that, that they had, not to be required to do it, but to do it because they ought to do it. And I, I don't think I had this in the column, but I've had many occasions to tell the lawyers in, in pushing their responsibility to do pro bono work, that it, it, it might sound a little corny, but it was absolutely true that they would never collect a fee in their practice of law that would give them a better feeling than the tears on a poor widow's face in a case that they had handled for them for free. And uh, that's true. Judge, not only were you involved in state bar activities, but you uh, were involved in supporting the University of Alabama Law School in, in various ways, and I believe you were involved with the Law School Foundation, is that right? Well, that's right. The Law School Foundation uh, is the organization that uh, handles uh, contributions that are made to the law school for various programs, and uh, I've been on the board of directors of the Law School Foundation for a number of years. My father was one of the uh, founders of the foundation, worked uh, closely with it, and I served on the, and still serve on the board of directors of it, and and uh, uh, served as president one year. We, my family has a uh, a fund there that that has now it has been accumulating through the years, but uh, a few years back we had enough to start it, and we have sponsored a, a lectureship there. We've had three Supreme Court justices down to speak at the university, to give lectures at the university as a part of that program, and uh, that's, that's one of the things that has been done. Judge, let me move to a, another area and, and talk for a moment about uh, your involvement or interest in politics and get you to, to comment and describe some of your political involvement and the, and the political involvement of, of uh, some of your ancestors there in the uh, All-Britain family. Well, I, I was uh, involved in campus activities at the university. Uh, as you mentioned a while ago, I was vice president of the Student Government Association and, and part of the responsibilities for that was to serve as uh, president of the student legislature. I believe you did the same thing when you were up that day. Yes, sir. Uh, and I was involved in all the various uh, political activities associated with that sort of thing and, and uh, had a considerable interest in, in that. Uh, when I came back home, I, I came into a, a, a family that had been politically active in, in different ways. My, my father had been on the State Democratic Executive Committee for 20 years, was not at the time I came back, uh, he was off of it. My uncle Bill had been 
uh, chairman of the Covington County Republican Party for a number of years. I think he and three or four other people made up the Covington County Republican Party and he'd been the chairman of it. So there wasn't much uh, Republican activity at that time uh, in 1962. But it was beginning uh, in Alabama. And uh, I got involved in, in uh, 1964 in the, in the Barry Goldwater campaign and uh, between 62 and 64 and around in that period, I, I got in, involved and active in, in the uh, statewide movement to uh, build a Republican Party. A two-party system was, was what we were particularly interested in. We felt that it'd be uh, best for the state if it had uh, a strong two-party system so that Alabama was paid attention to by both parties. And so uh, this was sort of the time of the building of the modern day Republican Party that, that I was involved in. After the, it was called the Goldwater Sweep in 64, in, uh, uh, people around the state felt like this was gonna be the year of uh, the realignment of parties in 1966. And so quite a few people from around the state, and I was included in this, uh, decided to be a part of the, of the team that was going to do that. Uh, this was the year that, that George Wallace couldn't run for re-election because he was prohibited from succeeding himself as governor, as, of course, at that time, very powerful governor. Uh, it, the, the idea was that he couldn't succeed himself, so this, and, and on the heels of the gold water sweep in 64, this was the ideal time. The Republicans nominated uh, Jim Martin to run for governor, very attractive candidate. Uh, John Grenier from Birmingham, who was the chairman of the state Republican Party, to run for the Senate, and uh, put together a slate of candidates for the legislature all over the state, and I ran for uh, the state Senate on the Republican ticket. A very unusual thing in our part of the state at that time to, uh, to have anybody running on the Republican ticket. The, the, the district was, senatorial district was Covington, Butler, Crenshaw, and Lowndes County. So we got into, after committing to run and everybody got on the ticket and everything, then all of a sudden, uh, Governor Wallace decided to run his wife for governor. Everybody laughed about that at first, but everybody quit laughing pretty soon. It turned into a very serious matter. As we got into the campaign, it became obvious that uh, that was the only issue. Uh, I would go around to I'd go in a country store and start talking to somebody about what I wanted to do uh, about education, about bringing industry and things of this nature. and. Uh, and I'd stop for a minute and somebody would say, well, are you for George? They didn't talk about being for Lurleen, it was all, were you for George? And I'd say, well, you know, I want to be able to work with whoever's elected governor. I, I, I want to do what's best for the people of my district. And when I get there, I want to be able to work with whoever's elected governor. And he'd say, uh-huh, you ain't for George. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what the campaign was all about. <laughs> I went down in flames who, along, along with everybody else. Who was your Democratic opponent? Uh, Alton Turner was a very powerful Democrat at the time, very closely aligned with, uh, uh, with uh, Governor Wallace and his campaign cards. I uh, had him in the middle, uh, George Wallace on one side and Lurleen Wallace on the other side. I'll never forget coming back <laughs> the, the day before the election. Jane and I were in, in our old beat up car driving down. I was 29 years old at the time <laughs> and didn't have any better sense than to do all this. And uh, we had Hal and Ben. Tom was on the way at the time. <laughs> and we were coming down. Uh, we'd been up in Crenshaw County shaking the bushes uh, they at the last day doing all we could and we came through uh, Louverne stopped at a traffic light and saw my opponent Alton Turner uh, coming out of a store in a sports shirt and had a, a 
golf bag hanging over his shoulder and was getting in his car and he was heading out to the golf course. He came over and spoke to us, said hello, and <laughs> I said hello too. <laughs> and we drove on and I thought, you know, this is really bad. He's heading to the golf course and I'm still <laughs> pathetically trying to <laughs> shake a few more boats out. Uh, Fletcher Jones also ran for, uh, at that time as an independent, so it was a three-way race, but it, it wasn't a race at all. Alton, uh, who, who was a very effective legislator, uh, won going away. That ended my career in uh, thinking about wanting to run for office. <laughs> but it, it was an interesting and a humbling experience. Alton Turner was from Crenshaw County, right? That's right. He was a lawyer, if I'm not mistaken. He was. There in Luverne? Yes, he was a lawyer. And you probably ran into him uh, not only politically, but probably uh, in cases from time to time. Oh, we did. I, Alton was a good lawyer, a good legislator, and a friend. Judge, you did some service on the State Republican Executive Committee. Uh, I did. I served about uh, 10 years, I think, on the... Uh, State Republican Executive Committee, and served uh, uh, for a number of years as as a Republican County Chairman in in Covington County. Uh, my uh, active political involvement had sort of uh, waned for several years before I was appointed to the bench. When I got so involved in in state bar work and with a uh, uh, law practice that was continuing to, to be demanding. Uh, my active involvement in, in politics sort of waned in the, in the later years of, of my practice. But you were busy with other things too there in Andalusia because I know you were uh, involved in various civic and community affairs there in your hometown. Tell us uh, about some of that involvement over the years. Well, I, I, I I did it all, I guess, as you do in a, in a small town, or as you should do in, a, in the cities, too. I, I was uh, involved in a uh, member of the Rotary Club, president of the Rotary Club. I was very involved with the Chamber of Commerce work, uh, president of the Chamber of Commerce down there one year. Served on the hospital board and, and uh, uh, served on the Arts Council and, and all of that sort of thing. I think it's... I think it's very important for everybody uh, to participate in civic matters like that, and and most lawyers do. That's you know that's one of the things that lawyers don't tend to get credit for. People think of lawyers as being pit bulls in the courtroom or something, but they forget that that uh, every time you see community activities going on, whether they be civic clubs or or uh, uh, little league baseball or or uh, any of these other things that the lawyers uh, actively participating in it. So I did all that. After coming to, to Montgomery, I, I've not done things outside of, of the court. Uh, some of the things are, are, are not appropriate anymore, I think, but uh, so I haven't been involved in that since. Judge, uh, when and under what circumstances did your interest in, in becoming a federal judge uh, develop? Well, through the, uh, through the years in, in trying cases all around, I uh, for a long time had in the back of my mind that, that at some point uh, being a judge would be something I, I would like to do. Uh, particularly interested in, in the federal bench uh, after trying cases in, in federal court uh, through the years, trying some cases before uh, Judge Frank Johnson and, and uh, uh, Judge Bob Warner, Judge Truman Hobbs, Judge Myron Thompson. I tried cases before all of them and, and uh, I, I particularly enjoyed practicing in federal court. Uh, it, it was always something sort of lurking in the in the back of my mind, as I guess it may be for a lot of trial lawyers. Uh, when in 1990, when it, it became apparent that there would be an opportunity, I, uh, Jane and I talked about it and we decided that, you know, if 
there's ever going to be a time that this was the time or, or pass it by and, and uh, forget about it. Uh, so uh, the first thing that we knew was that Judge Hobbs was going to take senior status, which would open a, a spot. Not too long after that, uh, Joel Dabino was uh, became known that he was going to be appointed to succeed Frank Johnson on the 11th Circuit, which would open another uh, slot for a district judge here and that there'd be two vacancies. So uh, being in my early 50s at that time and it, that being uh, the time or forget it, uh, we agreed that I'd let it be known that I was interested in it and, and, uh, and it kind of went from there. It was a long process that, uh, from the time I first uh, was talking some about it until the time I was sworn in, I guess, was at least 18 months or so. It was uh, <laughs> quite a period in, in my life trying to practice law and trying to do that as well and not knowing uh, what was going to happen. Uh, Elaborate a bit, if you will, Judge, on, on just what the process was, the process that you went through, the process in which you were involved uh, that that led to uh, your your nomination, your appointment? Well, at that time, uh, of course, we had a Republican president, George Bush. Uh, we had uh, two Democrat senators, Howell Heflin and uh, Richard Shelby, who was a, a Democrat at the time. When the senator state uh, has a senator or senators in the same party as the president, uh, the senators are the ones that uh, that have the the real active role in the appointment of federal district judges. Uh, when the senators are not from the same party as the president, they they don't have that same role. They they may have some involvement, uh, some involvement to the extent of of uh, opposing someone, but <coughs> from the point of making selections, they 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 are not in that role. So at that time, there was a, a committee in the state, uh, the, uh, about five people who were involved in, in screening folks and what have you. Uh, after a, a good while, it, it boiled down to, I don't know, three or four names, four, I think. Uh, were both, were, were both, excuse me for interrupting, but were both the vacancies uh, in play at the same time? Yeah, they, they, they were, there were two openings at the same time then. By, by that time, uh, Judge Dabino had been appointed and had gone on the 11th Circuit, and so there were two vacancies. Uh, from, from that group of uh, four, I believe it was, uh, everybody was invited at different times to uh, go up to Washington to uh, meet at the Justice Department for the interviews. And I went up there, I didn't, really didn't know what to expect. They didn't tell us what to expect, just come up there. But so I got there and uh, was interviewed by five different people. And uh, really sharp folks there in the Justice Department. I, I was very pleased to, uh, to find that, that was not asked any litmus uh, test type questions. Wasn't asked how I would rule on, on a particular issue or what my stand was on any controversial issue. Uh, there was, I'd meet with one lawyer and, and uh, just a one-on-one -on -one and be escorted to another office to talk with that person. And they asked a lot about about my background, about my type practice, uh, about uh, why I wanted to be a judge. Uh, and they asked things like what I viewed as the role of a judge. They were interested in, uh, although not in talking about specific issues, they were interested in, in, uh, in my feeling about what, what a judge's role was. And, And that sort of thing. So I was very comfortable with with all those interviews with four different lawyers, and 
then they, they said, now your final interview is with uh, someone else, and he's in the basement. They told me the room number, so I, I, <laughs> I got, got on, the, on that elevator and, <laughs> and went down to the basement, found the room. Well, this was not a lawyer. This was the political guy. Nice fellow, but this is what he was, the, kind of the political screener. So I went in, I was showed into his office, and I sat down, and he said, now, Mr. Albritton, you, you'll see that uh, I don't have any recording going on. I'm not taking any notes. This is just us talking. And so I said, well, he's got a good memory. <laughs> I'm sure of that. <laughs> and he said, I want you to, you got to lay it on the line with me. I want everything you say. Don't you tell me anything that's not absolutely right. I said, well, no, I wouldn't, wouldn't think of it. And he said, I want to know if there's anything about you or about your background, about your life that you haven't told us about that might in any way be embarrassing to the president. We don't want him to get out on a limb nominating you for this position and then be surprised by something. He said, you're being seriously considered for this job, and, and you owe it to him, and you owe it to us to not let us be surprised in any way. If there's something that, that uh, if you don't know whether it would hurt or not, tell me. Let us be the ones to decide. But if there's anything that could be dug up or come up, let's do it now, because we need to. You need to know it as well as we as to what the effect is going to be. It might not disqualify you. Might be fine, but now's the time to handle it. Let us be the. Well, I know you know. I I told him everything I knew, but I was just I was thinking just as hard as I could. Well, is there something I've forgotten about that might have anything? I couldn't think of anything, so I told him no, I didn't. He said, well, he said, now let me ask you specific. Have you ever run around on your wife? <laughs> I said, no, <laughs> I surely haven't. He said, have, have, have you ever been involved in drugs? No. <laughs> he said, have you ever, would, would there be anybody coming forward and say uh, you were bad to get out of somewhere and dance on the tables? <laughs> <laughs> I told my children about that when I came back from Washington and they got a real laugh. That didn't sound like their image of me at all. <laughs> Well, he, 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 and I said no to all that, and he said, have you ever been stopped by the police for anything? And I said, not other than a speeding ticket. And he said, how many speeding tickets? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, oh, why? <laughs> two or three <laughs> over, over, over the years. And he said, do you have a, a radar? thing in your car? <laughs> and I said, no. And he laughed and he said, um, that may sound silly, but we had two people who were uh, being considered for a judgeship, and they were, they were very close in qualifications, and one of them had a, a radar detector in a car where it was against the law, and that, that decided it. <laughs> and he said, uh, he, and he started telling me, this is an important position, and it's, uh, it's something that, that I'm telling you, we need to know everything there is to know about you. And that's why I'm asking you these questions. I said, fine. So we went on like that a while, and, and uh, I think I came out of it clean. <laughs> and I left. I was kind of drained after that last one, though. It was quite different from the first four. So then I came home and waited and waited <laughs> and waited. <laughs> now, my understanding is that at some point during this process, the the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, conducts some sort of investigation of, uh, of appointees. Did that come uh, before or after your name was actually sent up to the Senate by the President? Oh, it came before. I, I, uh, the first thing that happened, it was, it was quite a while. It was a few months after I'd been to, to Washington. Uh, I got a call from uh, I think it was from someone in the, in the uh, uh, legal counsel of the president's office, and uh, it told me that that the president had decided that I would be nominated for one of these vacancies if I, everything cleared. And they said, "Now, what 
we'll have to do first is have an FBI investigation made, and then the American Bar Association will do uh, an investigation. It's in your best interest not to say anything about this uh, at this time, because <clears throat> if you don't clear one of these things, the president never heard of you. <laughs> that he's, he, he, uh, that there's nothing official about this. And uh, uh, you, you will not be nominated if, if there's a problem. We, we're sure there won't be a problem and all this, you know. And they said, but, but you know, you, just, you would be well advised to just keep this completely to yourself, uh, just in case. Because uh, nothing will be done unless all this turns out. So I said, fine. And uh, so then I heard from, this was, I guess, in December of, 1990, they said, you'll be hearing from somebody from the FBI. So I got a call from a FBI agent. He was stationed down in Bruton. And he said, uh, I want to come up and do an interview. I'm just going to take a good bit of time. And I'd like to come up tomorrow if you can schedule it. And I told him I could. He said, now the first thing we're going to need to do is take your fingerprints. And our portable fingerprint machine is broken, but your office is right across the street from the police station there in Andalusia, so we'll just walk over there and have it done. And I said, to hell we will. <laughs> 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 you know, <laughs> in the town the size of Andalusia, me walk across with an FBI agent to the police station to be fingerprinted? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I said, but it just so happens that my son, Hal, is a municipal judge, and I think he can arrange to have the fingerprint machine <laughs> brought across the street to us. And he said, well, that'll be fine. <laughs> so he came up, and we did that. <laughs> During the course of that interview, he did, did kind of like the political guy in Washington. We got through with everything, and he looked at me with these steely eyes, and he said, now, is there anything, anything you haven't told me about? <laughs> And I said, yeah, I'm sure there are a lot of things, but I can't think of anything that would make any difference. And he said, he said, you know, that's the final thing that uh, we put in the report is he was asked if there was anything else that he wanted to disclose, and I'm going to put down no. And if, if anything comes up, it'll, it'll look as though you were hiding it. So that's the reason I'm asking this now. And I said, oh, okay, I, I, I've... Uh, told everybody who was asked everything I can think about in my life. I'd filled out a form for the FBI that listed everything from, uh, uh, well, it, we had to, had to list our neighbors all the way back to the time I moved away from home. So our neighbors in, in college, our, our neighbors in the Army, our neighbors in Andalusia, everywhere else, every organization I'd ever belonged to. Uh, uh, all this sort of thing. So my my life was a, an open book. I, I, at, at that time, I remembered uh, someone telling me that she was had been considered or was being considered for uh, some political appointment in the administration. Said after going through the FBI investigation, she decided that she'd rather just take her clothes off and walk down the middle of the street in downtown, wherever it was, than go through that again, that it was, a, it was something. And it was, but it's, you know, it's important, it's necessary. The FBI then came in and, and uh, began their investigation, which, uh, which was another thing there in, 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 in my little community of Andalusia. <laughs> And I guess that was followed by interviews with the uh, representatives from the American Bar Association. It was. When the FBI investigation turned out uh, no problem, then it went to, to that. Uh, they came in with it. They told me, the FBI people told me that they were trying to expedite this investigation because uh, they, they really were trying to fill uh, these seats as soon as they could. They were being pushed to to do it, so they were going to bring in a, a team of six people to do the investigation there in town. And they, all this was supposed to be secret, you know, but they, they, uh, they, they the six of them set up in a, an office over in the sheriff's office, 
the day after they started, I came home that night and Jane said, well, she said, I gotta tell you, I, a neighbor hailed me down as I was, uh, as I was coming home and came over and said, uh, Jane, I, I hope I hadn't done anything wrong, anything that'd be a problem for Harold. And uh, she, she, I said, whoa, 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 what are you talking about? <laughs> he said, he ran a store downtown. He said, well, this, this guy came in to my store today and said he had on a coat and tie and a, an overcoat on and he came in and he said, I'm looking for so-and-so. And I said, that, that's me. And he said, uh, he said he reached in his pocket and he, he pulled out something and he slipped it open and he said, I want to talk to you about Harold Albritton. And he said, I looked at that thing and I said, that's not Harold Albritton. <laughs> <laughs> he, said, he said, the fellow said, I know it's not, that's me. <laughs> that's, that's my FBI credentials. <laughs> he said, okay. <laughs> so he said he went on and talked with him. He said, so I hope there's nothing wrong and that doesn't hurt. <laughs> Who conducted the uh, ABA interview with you, do you recall? Um, trying to remember a name. She's from Florida. I'm sorry, I can't remember a name. Rod Nachman had been involved in that and, and uh, uh, introduced me to her. Uh, she was from Tampa, and her name escapes me at the moment. But I came up to Montgomery and, uh, and met with her and went through. I had to fill out another form for the ABA, a, a, a long bunch of things all about your law practice and the kind of cases you'd handled and uh, talk about I think it was 10 of particular cases of yours that uh, uh, came to mind and who the other lawyers were on it and who the judge was on it and all sort of stuff like that. And, and I met here in Montgomery with her. And eventually uh, President Bush uh, sent your uh, nomination to the Senate and you went through the Senate confirmation process. I did. Before uh, it was sent in, I after all this had been going on, it, it we waited a while after the investigations had, had, had been done, and then one day I, uh, our receptionist buzzed me, and I picked up, and she said, uh, the White House is calling. <laughs> I said, okay, so I picked up. It was somebody at the, uh, in the legal counsel's office and said, uh, everything has gone fine. President Bush wants to... Uh, find out if you would be available to talk to him tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. <laughs> I said, yes, I, I believe I would be. So uh, next morning uh, he called and uh, the president called and he, he uh, told me that he would uh, had determined that he wanted to nominate me to be United States District Judge for, for the Middle District of Alabama and hoped that I would accept uh, the appointment, and I told him that I was very honored and appreciated it, and, and we talked for a while. It was, uh, it was quite a rush. He, it, it was shortly after the end of the Gulf War, and so it was a time when, when President Bush was, was riding very high and uh, had, had done some real impressive things, and uh, I talked to him a minute about that. He talked to me a little bit about uh, some things he knew about me that uh, he commented on, which I appreciated, and I told him I would very, uh, be very happy to accept the, the nomination, and uh, hung up, and then they, they sent it over to, uh, to the Senate, and then a whole new investigation began. I had to fill out a whole bunch of other forms, and we started there. Was there anything about the uh, confirmation process that stands out in your mind? You mentioned the uh, questions that you got from one of the senators about your article about mandatory pro bono. Uh, anything else? Did you have the, the support, obviously, uh, you did, of the uh, Alabama senators? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, uh, Senator Heflin and, and Senator uh, Shelby were, were both very supportive of me, as was Congressman Dickinson. And I, I did get calls from staffers from both the uh, majority and minority sides in the, in the uh, Senate 
got a call from a staffer from the Democrat side who wanted to talk about organizations I was in. And one of them, I had listed the Blue Water Bay Sailing Club. At that time, we were into, into sailing down at, in Florida. And uh, she wanted to know if there were any women members of the Blue Water Bay Sailing Club or if they excluded women. And I said, <laughs> you know, I just belong to it and I've been in two races <laughs> and I don't really know. I've never looked into the membership. All I know is the, the second, the only other, uh, well, the second and only other race I've been in was won by an all woman crew. Now, whether they were <laughs> members of it or not, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, we talked about that uh, a good bit and other things. Uh, I, when I went up to be questioned by the Judiciary Committee, I was happy to be considered a, a non-controversial nominee, and I, I went up uh, at the same time as about, I think it was uh, five other nominees, four or five other nominees from around the country, and we went through the thing together. They, they took us one at a time. and and uh, and questioned us. Uh, Senator Heflin was was there on the committee at the time and was was very supportive and uh, appreciative. But one of the questions he did ask me was I referred to earlier. He said, "I want your commitment that if you if your nomination clears that you will remember always that you were appointed and not anointed." And I said. Uh, Senator, I've had occasion to say that about <laughs> about so many other judges over 30 years of practicing law that I know exactly what you're talking about, and you have my commitment. <laughs> uh, Senator Shelby was there in support of me, and Congressman Dickinson came and, and spoke on my behalf, and and it went uh, it went smoothly. We got uh, we got through with it, and Jane was with me. And, we went out and had had a big dinner and relaxed for the first time in about 18 months, I think. And you were, after being confirmed, sworn in as United States District Judge in May of 1991. Right. And at that point, you and your wife Jane moved from, from Andalusia, your home for many years, to Montgomery, where the, which is the site of the the courthouse for the Middle District. Right. Uh, was it hard for both of you to, to leave Andalusia after all those years to come to Montgomery? It was it was very hard. Uh, we had many friends. We, of course, had family there in, in Andalusia. Uh, it was hard to sell our house, hard to move. It really would not have been practical or worked at all to try to commute from Andalusia to Montgomery. We didn't feel it'd be, and had said this for a long time, didn't feel that it would be fair to to the court, to the lawyers, the litigants, anybody else to have me having to make that trip back and forth and felt that I should move to Montgomery. We should. So we did, but yes, we sold our house, uh, a house that I, a part of it that I'd lived in as a baby, and uh, uh, our son Hal and his wife and daughter were there in Andalusia, and the others were, were not yet, But uh, so we had to leave them and come up here. But it's not that far away, you know, about an hour and a half, so <laughs> we see a lot of each other, and it was difficult. We knew a number of people in, uh, in Montgomery from college days and from the years of practice in law, so it wasn't like coming into a, an unknown uh, community, and, and we've loved Montgomery since we've been here. Judge, I'd like to ask you uh, to talk for a few minutes, if you will, about uh, your service as United States District Judge here in the Middle District. And let me begin by just asking if you, if you would to, to tell us a little bit about your philosophy on the, the role of the court and the, the role of a judge sitting on the court. Well, it, it's become sort of trite from overuse of, of somebody saying the role of a judge is to interpret the law and not make the law. 
but I believe that, and it's, a, it's an overworked way of, of expressing uh, what I feel about it. The, in the three branches of government, the, the legislative branch and the executive branch, uh, really have a responsibility of, of making the law, proposing the law, deciding on policy bases, uh, uh, what the law should be. Uh, a, a judge can't do that, uh, should not do that. A judge's role should be to uh, try to determine what the law is as passed by the legislature or as, as, as developed through the years and uh, uh, not what he or she would want the law to be, not try to change the law. A judge has got to come to uh, the bench with uh, no agenda. A, a member of the legislature or a governor or a president has got an agenda, needs to have one, or doesn't have any business uh, wanting to be in that position. That's, that's their job, to try to pass laws that they think uh, would be beneficial to, to the people. Uh, a judge can't think that way. A judge can't think about results or think about, I want to use my role as a judge to save the world, uh, to make changes. My view of the role of a judge is that he or she is in that position to resolve disputes. And the course of doing that, uh, what a judge does often has widespread results outside of the effect on that particular case. But a judge's ruling shouldn't be based on what those effects are going to be outside the case. A judge's ruling should be based on what the law is in that case and uh, determining that dispute. The effect of it is, is something that you think about, but it shouldn't be a reason for your ruling. Uh, in my view, a judge should not be result-oriented. Uh, there have been quite a few times since I've been on the bench, that, and, and it's this way with all judges, of ruling in a particular way in a case that I would rather not rule that way. I wish the law were different. Uh, if I were a member of the legislature I'd, or, or a governor or president, I'd try to make it different. But uh, as a judge, that's not my prerogative. And I have to try to determine what the law is and then uh, uh, just rule down the line with uh, uh, the best you can determine as to what the law is. Judges are often asked to talk about the cases they've handled that are the most important cases or uh, cases of the of the greatest significance. Uh, how would you respond to, to a question like that? I, I really try not to think in terms of significance of a case. I, I don't know exactly what that means. A significant case, all cases are significant to the parties on them. There, there's not a lawsuit or, uh, involved that, that's not important to the people involved. I don't know whether a significant case is one that, that uh, stirs up a lot of interest in the press because of the facts, or whether it's something that uh, uh, is recognized as something that will, uh, will have widespread effects outside the case on other people. Uh, I don't know whether it's significant because of the results, and people, some people like the results, some people don't like the results. I, I think if a judge thinks in terms of a case being significant that it gets, it's dangerous, it gets, uh, it, it, it can put you in a position of, of, of getting result oriented. So I, I really don't like to think of, of cases that I have as being significant or not significant. I, I've been involved in a number of them that have, have gotten press attention, or, you know, that's, that's part of it. but. Uh, I personally don't like to single out a case and say this, these are significant cases that I have been involved in. They, they're all significant to the, to the parties and they're all significant to me. In, in the course of judging, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was thinking about, before this interview, I was thinking back to 
to the oath of office, and I, 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 I pulled that out. Because I, I think it's, it's important to, to keep and remember this. This is what I swore when I came into office and what others do, judges, uh, that I solemnly swore that I would administer justice without respect to persons and do equal right to the poor and to the rich and that I will faithfully and impartially discharge and perform all the duties incumbent upon me as a United States District Judge under the Constitution and laws of the United States, so help me God. All of that's significant, but I've always thought that one part of it that was particularly significant was a judge swearing to do justice, uh, to, to do equal right to the poor and to the rich. It doesn't say try to help the poor. It doesn't say try to protect the rich. It, it, it reminds a judge that it says equal to all and that the judge doesn't come in with, a, with an agenda, like I said earlier, that I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna change the world. I'm gonna make things better for everybody. We all would like to do that, but that's not the role of a judge. And I think a judge needs to keep focused on the fact that that you're here to do equal justice, not just to the poor, not just to the rich, but to both. And in, in the course of that, I think a judge has to be careful in, in, in a case that he or she has uh, not to expand what you do in a case beyond what's necessary in determining uh, the case and resolving the dispute. It's tempting sometimes to take a case that where you could go farther and, and, uh, and, and issue some rulings in ways that might have an effect that you'd like to have, but if it's not something that's necessary to the determination of the case, you shouldn't do it. Uh, judicial restraint is a, a, is a serious part of what I believe in as a judge, and it's, it's necessary in maintaining that, that uh, equal, uh, equal right and equal justice. On the other side of the coin, and this is just as important, and it's something that we're going to have in our, in our new courthouse. We, we're going to have uh, a conference room for the judges in the new courthouse. And one of the things that's going to be in there, the, one of the artists who's doing work over there is going to put a, a quotation on the wall that's going to be painted on there. And I, I selected one uh, that he's going to use that I think w that it'll be there when we're, when we're all meeting. And uh, I'll read it to you. It's from uh, Chief Justice Marshall back in 1821. It's from a case of Cohen's versus Virginia. And this is what it says and, and it's what it'll be uh, saying to us in the conference room. And this is the other side of the coin of what I was talking about on judicial restraint. It says, the judiciary cannot, as the legislature may, avoid a measure because it approaches the confines of the Constitution. We cannot pass it by because it is doubtful. With whatever doubts, with whatever difficulties a case may be attended, we must decide it if it be brought before us. We have no more right to decline the exercise of jurisdiction which is given than to usurp that which is not given. The one or the other would be treason to the Constitution. Questions may occur which we would gladly avoid, but we cannot avoid them. All we can do is to exercise our best judgment and conscientiously perform our duty. And that's a guiding light of, of what we should be about. How has your uh, experience as a, as a trial lawyer for some 30 years uh, helped you as a judge? Well, I hardly ever sit on a case that something doesn't pop in my mind about a, a case that I was in where I was on the other side of the bench. Uh, you go through that long a time of trying lawsuits and you have so many experiences that uh, you very often call on that experience rather than having to look something up. Uh, so it, it's been very beneficial as far as, as just familiarity with the rules of procedure and the rules of evidence and things of that nature. Uh, I guess another way that it's helped is being before different judges over 30 years time, you kind of 
get some opinions as to what judges should do and what they shouldn't do. And you like some things that have been done and you don't like some other things that have been done. And uh, I, I had many occasions through the years to say, now, if I were ever on the bench, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> if I were ever on the bench, I'd like to do just like that. Uh, and, and one thing from uh, quite a few years of, well, I, I, I may not, I ought not be too expansive on this because it didn't happen often. It didn't happen with many judges, but on occasion, uh, of having the experience of sitting in a courtroom with a whole courtroom full of other lawyers for a docket call or something and sitting there burning up a client's time for an hour with no judge and, and then have a judge breeze in the door, no apology for being late or no nothing, <laughs> and be gone. I, I vowed more than once that that would never happen if I got on the bench and I'd do my best to keep it from happening. <laughs> I'm sure there was a lot to learn um, when you became a judge. And in our earlier discussions, you related to me, uh, I thought, a particularly interesting story about your first criminal arrangement arraignments when you uh, went on the bench. Yeah, and that came after I'd already been through. Uh, uh, when you first come on, they, they take you with a few judges. I went over to Atlanta, actually the week before I was sworn in, with five other new judges, and we spent a week over there with... Uh, uh, some video uh, presentations and a, <coughs> a, a district judge sitting there with us, working with us uh, on into the evening for a week. And then not long after that, went to Washington to uh, judges go through what we all call baby judges school, and about 50 of us up there, new judges, for a week, uh, going through lectures and what have you, and things about how to be a judge procedurally. But this was one of the things they didn't teach me about. The first time I, <coughs> I had an arraignment where we had a, a bunch of defendants out there uh, to call to plead guilty or not guilty. <coughs> we had a case that, that had several defendants in it. It was a drug case. And uh, so I started calling the names and having them come up. And I called whatever, first name, second name. Got down about five ways down, and I said, uh, uh, Joseph Lanoue. Nobody stood up. And I said, Joseph Lanoue. Nobody stood up. I said, is anybody in this courtroom representing Joseph Lanoue, or is he here, Mr. Marshall? Do we need to send out for him? And <clears throat> one of the assistant U.S. attorneys stood up and, and said, uh, your Honor, the, the, the LNU there stands for last name unknown. <laughs> we haven't been able to find this man. <laughs> well, I wanted to say, well, of course I knew that, but I had, uh, I'd called a new too many times to get away with that. So I, <laughs> I said, well, thank you. You've just taught a new judge something. <laughs> and we went on from there. And I think there was also an interesting incident that relates to your first criminal case that you tried. First criminal case I tried, interestingly, uh, came out of Andalusia, and uh, two people were being uh, tried for charges that they had had uh, sold marijuana in a car one night in a parking lot outside of uh, Andalusia High School, and they had been under surveillance, and and it was a sting operation. Uh, an undercover policeman had lined it up with them to come in that night and he was going to make a buy and uh, there was talk about uh, weapons being involved and, and the, the, the policeman with the undercover agent was testifying and he, he said that he knew that these people had guns because he, he'd seen them in the car and all and, and uh, the prosecutor asked him well, who, who went out and he said well I uh, uh, my my wife at the time she's my ex-wife now, we've been divorced since, but she was in the car with me and, and then went on to talk about when he got there and, and he started to make the buy and at that time the, the uh, police cars with the lights blaring came whirring in and everybody jumped out with guns and people were diving under cars and everything else. Finally ended up, anyway, he finished his direct testimony and you know, one of the defense lawyers got up and he started questioning him and he was trying to 
and I guess attack his credibility. He said, uh, you, you, you say your wife was with you? And he, he said, well, my ex-wife. said, y'all been divorced since then? Yeah. He said, did she work for the police department? No. Did she work for the sheriff? No. She worked for any law enforcement agent? No. Didn't work for any law enforcement agent? No. Well, why, you know, the, the question you don't know the answer to, why do you ask it? He says, well, why did you take your wife out to this thing knowing that there were going to be guns and all this going on? Why did you do that? And he said, well, she had been coming in to me all the time saying, our life is so boring, you never do anything, it's any different. And so I thought, well, by golly, I'm going to do something different with her. So I did. <laughs> the jury just howled. Uh, I had a hard time keeping a straight face. Judge, tell us the the judges that that you served with here in the in the Middle District uh, since you came on the bench in 1991. Well, of course, uh, uh, Judge Johnson was uh, gone by then. He was on the uh, had just taken senior status on the Eleventh Circuit, so I never uh, served with him. I, I appeared before him as a lawyer. Uh, Judge Dabino had gone on the 11th Circuit. In fact, his vacancy is the one that, that I filled, so I didn't serve with him. When I came on, uh, Judge Varner, Bob Varner, and uh, Judge Truman Hobbs had both taken senior status, and uh, but they continued working here, so uh, they were handling cases at the time and handling quite a few. Judge Hobbs still is. Uh, Judge Varner has retired, but I, I served with both of them. It's interesting having uh, tried cases before both of them through the years, and, and we were working together. Then uh, uh, Judge Myron Thompson was chief judge at that time. And chief judge serves for seven years, and then it goes to the person below them with the most seniority, so it, it alternates like that. He was he was chief judge, and, and uh, I have uh, served with him and enjoyed serving with him for the whole time I've been here. The last case I tried, the jury case I tried before coming on the bench, I tried here in, in Montgomery before Judge Thompson and uh, it lasted about a week and a half, a products liability and fraud case that, that I was trying. And, and uh, he, he, he was then and is now a, a, a great trial judge. Uh, then uh, Judge Dement, Ira Dement came on uh, a while after I did and I've uh, enjoyed serving with him uh, since his appointment and, and up until now. Those are the ones I've served with. All uh, fine judges, very dedicated to uh, public service and, and I think uh, uh, performing admirably. You earlier mentioned uh, the Chief Magistrate Judge John Carroll. Uh, we also have a number of magistrate judges here in the Middle District and we have four now, uh, and, and they are as fine as any magistrate judges you can uh, find uh, anywhere in the country. Judge Carroll is the chief magistrate judge. Uh, judge Charles Cootie is uh, the other magistrate judge. Both of them have been here the whole time I've been here. Uh, judge Manzetta Penn McPherson is the next. She uh, was appointed, the magistrate judges are appointed by the district judges. Uh, Judge Thompson and I were the only two district judges uh, at the time that appointment was made. Judge DeMint had not come on yet, and we appointed Judge McPherson. And then uh, uh, Judge Susan Russ Walker is the fourth, and she was appointed by Judge Thompson, Judge DeMint, and me. And those are the uh, four magistrate judges. Lawyers who come to the courthouse uh, 
recognize, but perhaps the public doesn't as much, the unsung heroes in the courthouse and office staffs of the judges. Uh, and, I, and I know that uh, you'd like to mention uh, some of those people who've uh, played such an important background role uh, in, in, the, in the workings of the courthouse in your office. Oh, absolutely. Well, in the, <coughs> in, the, in the overall workings of the courthouse, Curtis Cable was the clerk of court when I first came on and, and served in that position for many years. He retired a couple of years ago and at that time was, if not the senior clerk in federal courts in the country, maybe second. Uh, he, he was wonderful to work with. Debbie Hackett has taken his place and is, is a delight. She came over from the, as you know, from the uh, state court system where she served about 18 years as circuit clerk in Montgomery. Uh, uh, the, the clerk's office does a magnificent job. Uh, the Bobby Longshore with the probation office has recently retired and Joe Nash has taken his place. Uh, uh, they, they are, they're just uh, uh, great. In my office here, I have the wonderful benefit of, of having, I think has got to be the best judi judicial assistant, we call them now, not secretaries, uh, that there ever was, and Elna Beerman. Elna was uh, here in Montgomery, was, uh, had been a legal secretary for a number of years. In fact, her first job as a legal secretary was for Albert Copeland, uh, worked for Albert for about a year or so, who was one of the greatest lawyers that, uh, uh, trial lawyers that this state's known. Uh, and, and she uh, had a, a great deal of experience with, uh, as a legal secretary elsewhere. When I came up, I decided that I had a lot of people applying for the job. I, I didn't want someone who had, had been a judge's secretary uh, or had applications there. I wanted somebody who'd been a lawyer's secretary and knew how I thought and how I worked and, and we'd learn being a judge together. And uh, she is just absolutely wonderful, brilliant person, uh, runs the office administratively and uh, uh, she's been with me ever since we started together. Uh, I've got another career employee. I have one of my law clerks as a career law clerk. Uh, this is her fifth year uh, with me. That's Lisa Harden. Uh, and Lisa is, Lisa was a Phi Beta Kappa graduate from Rhodes College and number one in a class at the University of Alabama Law School, Law Review and everything else you can think of. Uh, clerked for me for a year and then we started talking about staying and, and uh, she delighted me in agreeing to uh, stay on for the long haul. So she's been with me for, this is her fifth year that she's starting. Uh, I have two other law clerks working with me now. Uh, Brian Wall from Dothan. Uh, Brian is a, a graduate University of Texas Law School, with great record, and, and then Mike Boatler from Maryland is a graduate of George Washington Law School. Uh, both of them are uh, 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 terrific work. One of the real joys of this job is, is uh, these law clerks. We get some of the finest, brightest people from all around the country, many from here in Alabama, but many from other places too. That, uh, and, and the experience of working with them for a year or with Lisa through the year is something that just can't be, uh, can't be described in, in, in too glowing a terms, a terms. It's a wonderful experience. I've enjoyed every one of them. I, if we had time, I'd talk about all of them, but I know we don't have time to do that. Judge, before we move on to talk about other things, I, I'd like you to make some observations on, on this point. Thinking about your own law practice over the many years and your more recent experience on the bench, uh, how have things changed if they have and what do you like and not like about the, the court system or the practice of law as you see it today? Well, I, I hear people 
lawyers talking all the time now, and lawyers were talking this way when I left too about practicing law not being what it used to be. And I do think to a great extent it appears that, that uh, for various reasons, lawyers don't seem to, to think it's as much fun. Lawyers who've practiced a number of years, so many of them talk about, well, it used to be a lot more fun, a lot better. New lawyers coming in, are, uh, after a year or two, so many of them are saying, this is not what I expected. I, I'm not real happy with this. Uh, I, I don't know really whether that's more now than it used to be. I, I had those feelings before I came on the bench that it was things were not as much fun. Things that I, I think a lot of law practice has gotten uh, maybe too commercialized. The emphasis has been uh, a lot on the business side of practicing law. Uh, I remember well in my early years in, uh, of practice, one of the things that was being pushed around the country in the American Bar Association and elsewhere was that, that lawyers were not uh, getting the kind of income that they should because they didn't use good business practices. And the, the uh, push was on to, to, I remember when they started the push for the billable hour and they, they started all of this about what would produce more income. Uh, and and it, it was never it, it done in a way of saying you, you, you do your client wrong or you charge more than you should or, or, or anything. It was still serving the client, but the idea was that you, you're not making the income you should because you're not keeping up with your time and you're not considering yourself. Uh, so lawyers got in the, in, the, uh, in the business mode of keeping up with billable hours and other sort of things. And that's produced a situation where lawyers are making more money than they used to, but are not having as much fun as they used to. I think that it, it puts the emphasis on uh, not spending time on non-billable matters that lawyers may have in the past. I think that's part of it. The number of lawyers that are practicing now may have an effect on on areas of civility. Where some lawyers don't get along with others, and, and that's been a problem. Uh, but, but these problems shouldn't detract from, from the practice. They, they were, they were things that, that, were, that I didn't like about practicing law. They're, they're, they're always things, nothing can be always a, a high, but uh, I loved being a lawyer. I loved being a trial lawyer. It's a great change from, from being the lawyer in litigation to being a judge. You, I found out very quickly that it, it's not hard to, to get in the middle instead of on one side or the other, even though you spend most of your career on one side of the table when you, when you do a lot of trial work, you, you see both sides of a case, you have to in order to be able to represent your client. In doing so, you, you see that there are merits on the other side, you, you understand the other side, you also understand negatives about your side uh, in a lot of ways. And, and coming on the bench, it, it has, has really, I've not felt that there was a problem in, uh, in getting in the middle and, and, and trying to be uh, not swayed one way or the other because of, of prior practice. I hope I've been able to do that. I, it, 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 I feel that I have. But um, another of the big changes, you, you, you just you don't have the highs that you did as a, as a trial lawyer. You, you, I remember when I was at baby judges school, one of the people that was talking about being a judge said that Chief Justice Warren Berger used to give a talk to new judges, and the title of it was "Judges Don't Hit Home Runs," and, uh, and that's true. One of the great things of being a trial lawyer is the is the I don't know almost adulation at times of a client, the the, the feedback you get from being successful. I know. Uh, 
I've, I've had occasion to tell, uh, well, not long ago, we were having a, a trial, and, and the jury finally came back and ruled in favor of one particular uh, party, and he was a great big guy. I mean, he must have been six, five or six, probably weighed 250 pounds, and his lawyer was about my size, not very big, <laughs> and, and his client reached down and picked him up and hugged him, pulled his feet up off the floor and started crying. And, uh, you know, I walked out, and I was about to cry myself. I told my law clerk, I said, this is when I miss being a lawyer. <laughs> it really is. Now, while the jury was out, that's when I didn't miss being a lawyer. <laughs> Judge, are there particular joys or particular frustrations that you, that you feel as you sit on the bench today? Um, well, some of the some of the real joys are watching good lawyers uh, uh, perform, and, and you really do see a lot of that in in federal court. We have we have some of the finest lawyers around who who try cases, and uh, it's a a thrill and a joy to see a case well tried by good lawyers on both sides. It's just like in as a trial lawyer, you'd always rather have a top-notch trial lawyer on the other side of the case than somebody that's not because it, it makes for a clean fight, a clean case. They know what they're doing, they know what they can concede and what they have to fight on, and it's, uh, uh, it, it, it's a great experience. It makes the law work the way it should. And that's, uh, that's the way it is from uh, being on the bench, too, to, to watch it going on. I, I, I have to confess, I uh, often would uh, would kind of like to be over on the other side doing some of that that they're doing on a very interesting case. But uh, that has been a pleasure. Not to say that we don't have our share of lawyers who don't perform <laughs> to that uh, uh, in that way. That We have that too, and that's, uh, that's a frustrating part of it. You do see occasions where uh, a party's cause is, is, uh, is hurt by uh, poor quality of lawyering. That's part of the system. Uh, overall, it works very well. It's been an intellectual challenge. It's been hard work. Uh, I, the first couple of times I made talks to judges groups uh, after I came on the bench, I, I said, uh, you know, one thing I found out since I got here that I didn't know when I was a lawyer, and that's uh, that judges work hard. And nobody laughed. After the second time, I realized they didn't think that was funny, so I quit saying that. <laughs> but I have found that, uh, <laughs> I have to still say, I found that judges do work harder than I thought they did when I was a lawyer. Earlier in the interview, you uh, described the, the duties of the, of the chief judge, the position which you hold now. Uh, you became chief judge, uh, as I recall, in 1998, succeeding Judge Myron Thompson in that role. That's right. Well, in addition, Judge, to assuming all of those administrative responsibilities and continuing to maintain the full caseload that's traditional for the chief judge in this district. You also inherited uh, another project, one of substantial magnitude, that being the new federal courthouse. Yep. Uh, has, that, has that taken much of your time over the last few years? It's taken a tremendous amount of time. It, it really has. And, you know, I, I don't guess it it really would have had to, but when this thing first came up, uh, the judges here decided that we were going to take an active role in it. Uh, the, the courts are not, we're not ourselves involved in, in a, and we're not the ones that build the courthouse. That's the General Services Administration. And it's, it's, it's happened many times in the past in other places that when a courthouse was built, of the General Services Administration would just build a courthouse and tell the court, here it is, and the court would move over to whatever was there. Uh, we came in in the early phase of a new, of new courthouse construction around the country, 
where new courthouses were being built, and a number of uh, judges were pushing the idea that we shouldn't let this happen because there were a lot of real monstrosities as courthouses or, or just vanilla boxes, and that we should be involved in trying to, to have a courthouse look like a courthouse and not like an office building. So we decided here to make the commitment that we would be personally involved in it very deeply. And uh, uh, the GSA, General Services Administration, uh, agreed that, that uh, we would be involved, and so we have. So we've, all the judges have spent a lot of time, particularly uh, Judge Thompson at the time he was uh, chief judge and in the early design stage and all, and I, and I worked with him a lot then, and, and then now in the construction. So yeah, I, 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 for quite a while I've been doing something with the building some of every day. <laughs> How long has the new courthouse project actually been under discussion or consideration? As long as I've been here, which is nearly 10 years. One of the first meetings I attended of judges after I came on the bench was, uh, was one here where some people came down from Washington with the, from the administrative office of the United States Courts and from General Services Administration telling us that it had been determined that uh, Montgomery uh, needed a new federal courthouse, new facility, that we were out of space, because we all knew this, and we were, we were glad that they recognized it, that we were out of space, uh, and that a new building program was underway in trying to look for many years to the future and, and build what was necessary, so they wanted to add, at that time they were talking about adding on to this building, the, the building we're in, the Frank M. Johnson uh, Jr. Federal Building the United States Courthouse is a uh, historic building. It's on the National Register, the place where some of the landmark civil rights cases were tried by Judge Johnson. Uh, it's a beautiful building built back in the 1930s. It was getting run down and, and totally out of space, so the idea was that they'd add on to it. That's when it started, and the early part of it was what would uh, what was needed. So uh, everybody started having the input into what was needed, and then sometime after that, they came up with, okay, we're going to propose to Congress that uh, we have this many courtrooms, this many this, 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 and this, and then uh, then then the question was, how do we go about it? The first suggestion that was made to us was, well, we'll just add it on back of a, uh, an existing courthouse and, and go up as high as we need to go to put all this in. The thoughts of a just a straight up building tacked onto the back of this courthouse was just sounded terrible to us. That's the kind of thing that had been done in the past, and that's that's really when we made a commitment to get involved ourselves. We didn't want to detract from this courthouse at all, and that just didn't sound good. Well, they were saying, well, that's the only thing you can do. We don't have, that's the only place we can add on. It's either that or, or close down this courthouse. And they said, but then we can do that. Let's, let's think about that. We'll go out and get some land out, out from town, out on the bypass or somewhere like that, and build a you know, brand new federal courthouse. All of the judges here were against that. For one thing, we wanted to maintain this courthouse. It's a, it's a historic courthouse, it's one that, that has meant a lot in the past, and it's one that should be maintained. Uh, furthermore, we, we, we felt that uh, the federal courts had an obligation to the community to, uh, to not do something that would further the deterioration of downtown. So we wanted to stay downtown, we, and we wanted to stay here. The problem was we had a street right next to us and, and nowhere to go. Just in kind of brainstorming and kicking things around, uh, Judge Thompson came up with the idea. He said, well, what if, what if we were able to get the city to close Moulton Street over there and, uh, and, uh, and be able to grow over to, to the west, acquire some land on the other side of that? And uh, everybody said, well, you know, that, that would work if they could do that. So. Uh, 
remember Judge Dabena and I went down and talked to uh, Mayor Farmer about this idea. He was very receptive, uh, except he said it'd have to be in the best interest of the of the city. We'd have to take a traffic count and see where everything was. But he very much liked the idea of, of the court staying downtown and not moving out. So he did a study, had a study done without saying anything about it. Uh, determined that, in his opinion, closing the street wouldn't create any major problems. And so it was presented to the city council and they agreed to do it if we were going to move over there. So that, that's what started the move to uh, go to the west and build what we have now, uh, which officially is, is uh, called the, the annex to the Frank M. Johnson, Jr. Uh, federal building in the United States Courthouse. Was it necessary to actually acquire some, some, some property? It was. On the other side of Moulton <coughs> Street, uh, they acquired a number of pieces of property over there, uh, some of them by purchase, some of them uh, by condemnation. Some of it had to be done by condemnation. Uh, and there was some property behind the courthouse, uh, the oldest brick residence building or maybe brick building at all in Montgomery was uh, back there being used as a convenience store at that time but had been a, a school for for boys and had been a, a car dealership I think and had uh, uh, had begun as the house of I think the the contractor who built the, the uh, capital here in Montgomery. At one time it was owned by a used, used or owned by a uh, uh, general in the Federal Army during the War Between the States. Uh, it had a, a lot of history and uh, that was a, a big issue. No, some people suggested just, well, you know, it's old, bulldoze it down and move on and, and uh, we didn't like that idea and the preservationists didn't like the idea at all, but what to do with it? It was in the way, so it ended up being given by the uh, General Services Administration to the I guess the County Historical Society, I don't know who has the title to it now, but it was a, a gift by the General Services Administration and moved up the street a block, which was quite a sight to see that brick building moved by some uh, specialists in that from Savannah who came over and, and, and moved it. And it's being used by the County Historical Society now. The other thing that's behind the courthouse is the, that's going to be preserved uh, is the, the old Greyhound bus station. Uh, it was the uh, site of uh, an incident in the Freedom Rider movement. Judge Johnson was on the bench and uh, the idea again there was to preserve that, not have it torn down. It has been uh, leased on a long-term lease from General Services Administration to the state of Alabama or some uh, branch of it. I'm not sure who actually uh, has the lease, but it's the State Historical Commission and, and all is, is going to turn it into a museum, not a general civil rights museum, but a museum uh, having to do with the Freedom Rider movement nationwide and the incident that happened here in Montgomery. Uh, that's in the planning stages. I understand that they uh, have gotten money to fund a study on it and have some people I believe from Boston who have done a lot of museum work who are, who are designing it. It should, should be quite a place for Montgomery but the court's not involved in that. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's the state and it, it will be done as soon as this other project is finished. Judge, you mentioned that the, uh, the judges decided to become actively involved in sort of creating a vision for the, for the new building, the, the annex building. Uh, what sort of uh, groundwork or investigation, uh, fact-finding process did, did you judges go through with, uh, with others who were involved to try to decide just what would make sense for the new building? Well, before an architect was even decided on, <coughs> While that was being done, uh, that, that was a competition with people from all over the country about being the architect. While that and other things were going on, uh, we, were, we were looking into trying to decide what we wanted 
here. And we, we, we got a lot of literature on courthouses. And then we started doing some, uh, some traveling, both before and after we got an architect. Uh, Judge Thompson and I made some trips together. Curtis Caver went with us. Uh, some others to, to tour courthouses. We looked at them around the state. We also went to, uh, to Boston and uh, went through the old courthouses there. Bill Young, who's now the chief district judge in Boston, took us for two days around the courthouses around in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, old historic courthouses and new ones looking at various things. Uh, we went out to Kansas City to see a new federal courthouse with some features that we were interested in. Uh, and everywhere we went that had new courthouses, we would talk to the people uh, who had built them and, and ask them if they had it to do over again, what would they do different? What, would they, wh what mistakes did they make? What did they think they did right? And we, we got a lot of good pointers from them. Uh, we were reading books, we were talking to people, we were doing all kind of spade work. Uh, and, and then the architect also went with us on, on uh, some trips after the architect was selected. Who was selected to do the architectural work on the new building? Uh, Bargainia Davis Sims, uh, architects here in Montgomery, were ultimately selected. Uh, there were quite a few firms that were competing for the work. Uh, Lee Sims is the uh, chief design architect with them, and, and, and he is the one who, who designed the building. He's also the one who designed the State Judicial Building uh, on Dexter Avenue here, so he'll have two major courthouses that he's designed. Uh, they won the competition and, and designed the building, and uh, it, was, it was quite a quite a thing getting the building designed. Uh, he, they, GSA had, had them submit four or five different plans of concepts. Uh, some people in Washington wanted a different thing from what we wanted. What we're getting now is this curvilinear design that ties it in. What we had said all the time was this existing courthouse is going to continue in operation, and we want this to be a complex. We don't want it to be look like something tacked on to this building or something that would detract from this building. We wanted the end result to be a complex. We had in mind a, a plaza that would tie it all in in some way. Uh, and Lee Sims came up with about five different concepts, uh, one of them being uh, just straight up over there, one of them being square, uh, different things, but one of them being this curvilinear thing. This is, was his preference, and it was also our preference from the beginning. Well, some of them in Washington didn't like that. They, they didn't think that this was uh, practical. They thought it would waste space and all this. So, I guess in the course of getting this thing designed and finally approved, we, we went, Judge Thompson and I went, I think, three different times to Washington to meet with people. And Judge, when you say you went to Washington, uh, elaborate a little bit on who you were going to see and just what the role of the GSA is. Well, GSA is the, is the uh, uh, part of, of, of the executive branch of the government that's in charge of, of uh, a real estate for the federal government. They own post offices, federal courthouses, federal buildings, things of this nature. And they have the ultimate responsibility for building the courthouse and the ultimate say-so on, on uh, what they're going to look like, how much they're going to cost. Congress plays a role in how much money you get, but uh, it's, it's really GSA's role and responsibility to make the final decisions on these kind of things. So. We were not able to dictate any any terms, but but they were very nice about listening to us. We had disagreements about what what should be done, but uh, they heard us out and ultimately went along with with our wishes on the on the design. And so that was who we were meeting with. The first big issue was whether or not to go with this curved design, and uh, they ended up deciding to go with it. The architect had to justify the use of space and show why it wasn't a waste, and all of this was good because we didn't want to waste taxpayers' money any more than anybody else did. The architects were able to show them that it actually was, was uh, 
it, it saved a lot in different ways by doing it. So what we've ended up with is a design that uh, it's already won some award and it's going to win some others. It's, it's going to be, uh, I think, the finest federal courthouse in the country when we get through it. It's, it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be utilitarian also, and it's not uh, extravagant. It's got some beautiful features, but they're all done in, in ways that are not extravagant and, uh, and that uh, conserve the taxpayer's money. The uh, contractor uh, on, on the project was eventually selected uh, by GSA, and, and who, who is the contractor? Yes, GSA selected the contractor. It's uh, Clark Construction Company. They're headquartered in uh, Baltimore. Uh, at the time they got this contract, they were, uh, I believe, the, the largest uh, construction company for federal buildings in the, uh, in the country. They were involved in a number of other federal courthouses and other federal buildings. GSA selected them uh, with competition from other Places. When did construction actually begin? Mm. Gosh, it seems like 10 years ago. I, I, I don't know. I, 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 the, the time that it started escapes me. I, I do remember that we had the, the uh, groundbreaking out there and then it was six months after that uh, before we actually started the construction. One of the reasons was that during that time the Oklahoma City bombing happened with the federal building out there and that changed everything. We had to put in a lot of security devices that we didn't have before and had to go back to the drawing board on a, a number of things there. And, uh, and also it turned out that uh, the funds that had been provided by Congress were not going to be sufficient to cover everything after all these changes were made and all. So, uh, we had always wanted to have the, the annex with limestone on the outside, just like this building. And it developed that it didn't look like that was going to be possible without some more money, so GSA's idea was to use pre-stressed concrete or brick. And we were very much against that, and that was one of the things we went to Washington. And anyway, uh, Senator Shelby weighed in on that for us and was able to get some additional funds provided that then allowed us to go with, with limestone. Uh, limestone, incidentally, from the same quarry in Indiana that the limestone for this building came from, so it's the same place. You mentioned that the, that the judges of the, of the district uh, had a great interest, have a great interest in the building and have been very involved, but obviously it wasn't possible for the judges to keep track of what was going on on a day-to-day -day basis, and I understand you had to come up with a, some solution to that, to have somebody in place to sort of be the clerk of the works, if you will. Yes, that, that became apparent uh, fairly soon. We were, we were well into it. I think we'd already selected the architect, but it was getting to where uh, Judge Thompson and I were both realizing the amount of time that we were spending with a lot of detail. Uh, it, was, it was getting out of hand and we were either going to have to uh, stop doing so much of the detail work or, or just uh, or do something. And I'll have to say I think the greatest contribution that I've made to this new federal building is a suggestion that we needed to uh, hire somebody and coming up with just the perfect person for it. We, uh, I went to Washington about this, about trying to get somebody in this role. Uh, a, a lot of new courthouses were beginning, but uh, nobody had people who were just on a project to, to run the project. Some of the larger courts in the big cities would designate a, a person from the clerk's office to spend most of his time or her time dealing with that, but that was just somebody uh, who worked there in the office. And I was trying to find out if there were any funds available for us to hire somebody to run this project for us, to work for the court, to uh, deal with GSA, to deal with the administrative office of the U.S. courts, to deal with uh, all the myriad of details, to deal with the bureaucracy. Uh, and this was new. They didn't 
They didn't have things like that. So we kept knocking on the door and coming up with different ideas. Curtis Cable was working with us, trying to come up with something. Finally, we were able to get some funds provided to create a, a slot. It wasn't designated for this project, but it was just another position in our clerk's office that we could use to fill with somebody in this role. Well, about that time, uh, Reggie Hamner had retired after 25 years as executive director of the Alabama State Bar, and Reggie and I had known each other the entire time we were there, and when, when I was president of the State Bar, he and I were heavily involved in building the addition to the State Bar building. That was one of the things going on throughout my year and was finished in the next year. So we'd been through a, a substantial building project together, and uh, Reggie did not have anything else at the time. I had a number of people talking with him about coming with him and various things, but he was taking his time to look around. And so I talked to Judge Thompson and Judge DeMint, said, uh, you know, if I could get Reggie Hamler to come on board and take this job, what would y'all think? Well, both of them said that would be wonderful. He'd be, he'd be ideal if we could get him. So I got Reggie to come in and, and uh, I told him what was going on and I told him what the position was that we envisioned, which at that time we said it'd probably be a part-time job, about half-time and, and uh, it'll last three years. And uh, but this is this is what you would do and I said you'll have to kind of create the job yourself. There is no job description. So he said, you know, that's really intriguing. That sounds very interesting. Let me, let me think about it over the weekend, talk with Ann and see what I might want to do. So he called and came back in on Monday and said, I'd like to do that. That sounds like something I'd really like to do. Well, uh, as, as, as Yancey said, the, the man in the aisle had met <laughs> when, uh, when, uh, when Reggie came on to this project. He was ideal. He was a lawyer. He'd been through building uh, a building project before. He had 25 years of dealing with bureaucracies in, in the state. He knows their language. <laughs> he knows where, <laughs> where things are hidden. He knows how to deal with them. And he came on as court project coordinator. And he's been on it ever since. Well, instead of a part-time job in, in three years, it's been a, more than a full-time job. He, 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 he spends an inordinate amount of time on this thing. And it's, it's, it's gone on for five years now that he's been with it, and, and uh, the end is, is not here yet. But he loves it. He's done a magnificent job. I don't know what we would do without him. And uh, since this time, other courts have, have uh, done the same thing and have created this position. He's, he's been the, the one who uh, pioneered it and showed how important it was. Tell us, if you will, Judge, uh, just what... What will be in the in the the new building, the the building that will be known as the annex, but which is in and of itself a a, a, a magnificent structure. And it's larger than this building, even though it's it's the annex. Well, it's going to have it's going to have five district courtrooms and a ceremonial courtroom or a special proceedings courtroom. All these will be on the second floor. Of the same floor as, as uh, uh, our main courtroom in this building. And it'll be connected by a bridge so that you can come from this building over into the uh, new building uh, on a, a pedestrian bridge behind this existing building. So on the second floor, there'll be uh, those courtrooms and the special proceedings courtroom is one which is a little larger than the others. It can hold not only uh, ceremonies and things, but it can hold larger trials where we have more parties, more defendants, uh, and, and uh, special trials. On the floor uh, below that, uh, the first floor where you walk in, the main building will be the clerk's office and the United States Marshal's office and things such as the, the uh, uh, jury uh, assembly room and and various things. Down in the basement, there's going to be, that's going to be the area for the grand jury room, the, uh, a snack bar down there. Uh, on the third floor will be the, the uh, district judge's chambers, 
it'll be connected by uh, a bridge over to this new building, the old building. And on the fourth floor, <coughs> we're going to have courtrooms for the magistrate judges and bankruptcy judges. Bankruptcy will be coming back into the uh, building with us. Um, there'll be there'll be two two uh, magistrate courtrooms and chambers on the fourth floor, and on the other side will be four bankruptcy courtrooms. We only have two bankruptcy judges now, but one will be available for uh, later if the court grows. The fourth is going to be uh, fitted out and used as a, <coughs> as a video conferencing center in an area where that can be done with uh, uh, remote connections all over the country for various things in connection with uh, trials or uh, criminal matters. Then on the fifth floor are going to be the other two magistrate courtrooms and chambers and eventually will be uh, a part of the United States Attorney's Office. Uh, for the time being, while this uh, existing building is being renovated, that part of the fifth floor is going to be occupied by the uh, circuit judges who are going to be in this building, back in this building eventually, and by uh, uh, Senator Shelby's office, who will be over in this building when it's renovated. So it's a, it's, it's a large building. Uh, it spreads around uh, a long area when you're walking down a hallway, but the idea was to keep it the same height as this existing building so that it, it, it tied in with it. And it's the same height as this building, the same number of floors. You mentioned that the existing building, the one where we sit today, is going to be uh, renovated once the, the move is made into the, into the annex. Right. What will uh, eventually be in the old building? The uh, circuit judges who are here in Montgomery will, uh, will occupy two floors over here, and that's uh, Judge Joel DeBena and Judge Ed Carnes. Um, Judge John Godbold, uh, senior circuit judge. They'll be back over here with, with chambers. Uh, they'll also be, there is now a, a circuit courtroom where appellate cases are heard when the 11th Circuit Court of Appeal sits in Montgomery. Uh, right now it's being used for that. It's also, I'm using it as a courtroom with a temporary jury box over there. That's one of the reasons we need more space. It's going to be uh, uh, renovated. The uh, on the second floor, Judge Thompson is going to move back over into this building eventually. Uh, it's his wish to maintain uh, the courtroom that he has now, which was the courtroom used by Judge Johnson as a, an active courtroom, and so it's going to also be r renovated and. <coughs> Some of the sound problems in there and some other things are going to be hopefully uh, corrected, but uh, he wants to and will maintain that as an active courtroom with his chambers there. Uh, we'll also, uh, the U.S. Attorney is going to be up on, on the fifth floor in this building, and we're going to have pretrial services and, and uh, uh, probation office. Actually, those offices are being combined now, but they're going to be over here. Uh, and that. And then we're going to have some congressional space. Uh, Senator Shelby is going to have an office here. I'm not sure whether the uh, Senator, I don't think Senator Sessions wants to have an office here. I don't believe either of the congressmen who have Montgomery, parts of Montgomery in their district, uh, want to be in this building either, but Senator Shelby will be. Judge, I guess in the planning of the, of the new courthouse structure, a lot, of, uh, a lot of attention was given to technology in the courtrooms and, and generally, I suppose. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I'll have to say that I'm uh, technologically challenged. Uh, I'm, I'm not uh, personally up on all this, but I, I do want this courthouse to be able to have it all because that's the coming things in trials of cases and, and uh, in, in preparation and, and in many ways. So our idea from the beginning has been to have the flexibility that the, the courtrooms and everything else can be adapted to uh, to new technological developments without having to have wires strung all over the place and whatever. Of course, 
nobody knows what's coming in the future. We may not even have wires in the future, but if we do, we don't want them draped around the floors of the walls. So we've got things such as in the district courtrooms, they're all going to have hollow floors. They're going to be, a, a, I think it's a four inch uh, a hollow floor with conduit running around all over the place under it. And uh, so that if, if you need, even if you need anything else in the future, you can pull the carpet up and go under the floor and put something else in, put it back down rather than having to run wires. We've been fortunate enough to, to get funds appropriated from the uh, administrative office of the United States courts to, to put uh, equipment in the courtrooms that will be the, the most up-to-date things that, that uh, we have as far as evidence presentation. They're going to be uh, evidence presentation carts that will uh, allow uh, lawyers to put a document or, or a pistol or a set of keys or whatever they might want down on a screen and it'll flash up on the other screens. The jury boxes are going to have little uh, monitors for each two seats, I think, that things will flat come up on. Uh, they're going to have, uh, we're going, as I said a while ago, we're going to have a uh, a video conferencing center. We're going to have some mobile units that will be able to be transported from courtroom to courtroom so that if you had somebody uh, testifying uh, from Washington State, you wanted to have them testify live and be able to cross-examine them from here, uh, that could be hooked up so that the person there would come over uh, the screen and everybody would see them and, and, and you'd, the lawyers would be able to examine them from here. That may be used some in, in criminal matters for uh, various things without having to transport uh, prisoners from, from prisons or from jails over here, but uh, have hookups for them there. Uh, I think everything that, that there is technologically right now available is going to be in this new courthouse. It'll be state of the art on whatever the, whatever we need. Well, in addition to being technologically state of the art and being functional and economical as you've described, uh, the new courthouse facility is also going to have some uh, very nice aesthetic features. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what's planned in that respect? It's really going to be a thing of beauty for, for the community. It excites me every time I think about it. The first uh, work of art is the building itself. I think it's a, a beautiful and magnificent design that Lee Sims has done. And it's, it's got some features in it that in and of themselves are, are, are real works of art. The first floor lobby where you walk in is, is got uh, red sandstone on the walls. It's just beautiful and it's the only part of the building that has that. The rest of the building has other kind of stone, but that's a, a feature of it. The, the main lobby is going to be on the second floor, and uh, it's going to go up for three, f uh, th three stories. It'll be a three-story atrium. Uh, and all of this has been done in a way that actually conserves space in other places that makes it uh, uh, no more expensive or, or costly to run than if, if it were just a regular one floor level, but it's going to go up three floors. It's all glass in the front, and, uh, and, and that feature itself is a, is a work of art. In addition to the building, there, there are three uh, things that have been commissioned that are, are going in. I told you a while ago that one of our ideas all along had been uh, a plaza to tie in the two buildings, and so we do have in front of the new building a, a large plaza that people will walk across. It's, it's, uh, it's going to be dominated by a work of art that was commissioned by GSA under a program called the Art and Architecture Program that federal projects for a few years have had a certain percentage of construction costs set aside to commission a, an original work of art. It's a great program that the government has. It's not money that they give you to go out to a shop and buy paintings or something to bring in. It's, it's money to commission an artist in one form or another to create a new work of art for the public. 
So they had a contest to pick the person here. The, there were quite a few people in the community here who were put on a committee to work with GSA. Uh, the judges were working with them. We probably had over 100 uh, applications from uh, people from around the world, really, uh, who submitted examples of their work. There were painters, sculptors, uh, uh, all different kinds of, of artists. They weren't submitting something they wanted to do here. They were just submitting what they've done in other places. And the committee went through them all and then narrowed it down to, to five finalists. And the five finalists were asked to submit some more things, some slides and all, and then the judges got involved at that point looking at their work. And the committee ended up uh, commissioning uh, a sculptor by the name of Clyde Lenz, who uh, lives in New Jersey, to do an original work of art for this building. Uh, he has done some uh, fine things in other parts of the country. He has a sculptor on one of the walls in the uh, new Foley Square Courthouse, the big federal courthouse in Manhattan, uh, and, and a number of other places around the country. After he was commissioned, he came down and met with the committee and met with the judges to talk about what do you want. He had some ideas, we had some ideas that went back and forth, and he finally came up with the idea of doing a fountain that would be in the center of the plaza, and it would be, uh, the face of it would be the face of Themis, the goddess of justice. Uh, it's, it's being done in a well, it's out there now. It's done in stainless steel. The sides of it have two big bo stainless steel bowls that uh, represent the scales of justice. The water comes out of the bowls. The, uh, the, the back of the face has the 13 stripes of the American flag, and one of the stripes comes across the goddess of justice's eyes, representing the blindfold. Uh, it's lighted from uh, under the water, it comes up through the water and gives an effect on the, 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 fla uh, the flag in the face of a waving flag. It's, uh, I've got a, a picture here that was sent down by Mr. Lenz the other day that uh, that's, that's what it looks like. That's the face of the goddess of justice and she's out there now. It's, it's, uh, it's beautiful and it's something that uh, that the people in the community will enjoy for a long, long time. We, we made the decision early on that for this work of art, we didn't want something that was inside where you had to be a litigant or, or something to see it. We wanted it to be a real work of public art that, that everybody could see whether they came in the courthouse or not. So we wanted something outside. That was what the judges wanted. And that was readily uh, agreed to by the committee, and that's what Mr. Lynn's commission was, to do something outside. That's what it is, and it's going to be great. That's the, that's the first work of art that you'll see other than the building. And there are others. Yes, a, a, a real feature is uh, another sculpture, and it's, uh, it's above the door, and it's a, it's a big eagle, and it was done by uh, a gentleman by the name of William uh, Galloway from Indiana, uh, he did this sculpture of an eagle out of, uh, out of limestone, actually out of a block of limestone that came from the same quarry in Indiana as the limestone around the building. Uh, in the little town where he lives in uh, uh, Bloomington, Bedford, Indiana, the, the Times Herald there put out a, a three-page issue of the paper devoted to his, to his work on the on the eagle, it, 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 it's got some of it there, and then it, uh, it comes over here for, for two more pages showing how he went about doing the job and how his, uh, uh, his, his helper helped him. It's the largest project he's ever had. Uh, it's, uh, it's a huge sculpted eagle. They brought it down here on a flatbed truck and, and raising it and putting it up there was a real project. This newspaper, incidentally, is going to be maintained and in a historical archives that, that uh, we're developing to put in over there that, that uh, you on the committee are familiar with. Eddie Patello is working with us on, but uh, these things are going to be maintained 
in the future. So that eagle is a, is a great work of art. That's the second one that you'll see. Finally, uh, I, I think that people all over the country are going to be blown away when they see the artwork of David Brawley in this courthouse. Uh, David Brawley is an architect, lives in Montgomery. He's been on the faculty of the uh, School of Architecture at Auburn for quite a while. He's taken a leave of absence this year. But he is, he is a, a, a wonderful artist, and he has done paintings in the, on the, for the ceiling of the uh, first floor lobby. He has done paintings for the ceiling of the third floor, uh, uh, or rather the second floor atrium. It's hard to describe in words. Uh, to see this ceiling, it was uh, it was panels that were done uh, on canvas. He painted them hanging up on the wall in the old Elite Cafe down there. I watched him as he was putting them together, and then when he got the canvas panels painted, uh, they took them over there and, and and they were hung on the ceiling uh, by a paper hanger, like wallpaper, and they're, they're just beautiful up there on the on the ceiling. And I, I guess maybe the biggest feature that he'll have, the five district courtrooms on the second floor, uh, all have behind the bench uh, murals behind the bench that are, uh, that are painted back there. And the theme is the preamble of the Constitution of the United States. And he has one of the points of the preamble as the feature on each of the murals. They're basically uh, are the same with a an architectural design and a, a coin in the middle w with the, with the uh, point that's being made from the preamble around the coin and s something different in the center. And then in the first floor lobby, when you first come in over on the left on a, on a painted wall, he has, he has imprinted the preamble, the full preamble to the Constitution there, leading into the artwork behind the benches on the second floor. Uh, you know, our idea, and, and Reggie Hamner was very involved in, in uh, getting David Brawley involved and in some of this other too, but all of our idea was there's no reason that a functional building can't also be pretty. So uh, this is going to be beautiful. On behalf of uh, the lawyers of the Middle District and on behalf of the uh, historical committee that the court appointed for the Middle District, we want to thank you uh, not only for your dedicated service as judge and chief judge of this district, but uh, particularly for you making yourself available for this interview today, which I'm sure will be uh, enjoyed by many people in the future. Thank you very much. Well, Dave, you're welcome. I want to thank you and, and, uh, and, and Bobby Siegel and, and uh, John Scott and the other members of the Historical Committee for doing this. Uh, uh, you've spent a lot of time, all of you have on it, and, and we're all appreciative. It's something that uh, We'll maintain things for the future, and, and I thank you for your time. I've enjoyed chatting with you.